is this attractive figure. Oh, my laser's not working. Okay, this guy in the middle. Um, as you heard from the group, you got an o kind of an overview of his life, his contributions, the things that, that he has done. Actually, give me one second. I might have to pause this and reset this. At the All right, so I'm relegated to not use to sticking by the keyboard here. We'll be talking about this work, his essay concerning human understanding. Um, what we will be talking about today roughly covers materials from the first two of those four books. Um, and then next week we're going to say a little more about materials in the second book, and I'm going to actually give you a little extra reading that goes into the fourth book. So, in book one, chapter one, um, in sections one and two, Locke tells us what he's up to in this essay. That the goal of it is to inquire into the origin, the certainty, and the extent of human knowledge. Um, and he lays out, this is roughly the structure of what he's trying to do in the whole book. First, he wants to talk about where do we get our ideas from? Where, what is, where do they originate? Secondly, um, he wants to understand the knowledge that the understanding has by those ideas. And third, that the nature of beliefs uh, that one can infer from these ideas. So where do we get ideas? The knowledge that we acquire through those ideas, and then anything that we can infer from that knowledge. This should, be, this should almost sound a little bit, not exactly, but a little bit like what Descartes was doing, where it's like, hey, where do we get the basic foundational starting point? From those starting points, what can we know? And then from that, what can we know from there? Uh, a, a similar kind of foundationalist structure. If you have your books, let's open them up to page 317. Um, I actually just realized that I left my book in the office, so I'm going to ask if I can get a volunteer to read, and I will point out uh, where you can start reading. Any volunteers? All right, so let's look at 317. Um, Let's start in the, almost in the middle of that bottom paragraph where he says, we should. Yeah, and just read that to the very end, please. We should not then perhaps be so eager out of, a, out of an affect, affectation of a universal knowledge to raise questions and perplex ourselves in obvious disputes about things to which our understandings are not suited, and of which we cannot frame in our minds any clear or distinct perceptions, or about which, as it has perhaps too often happened, we do not have any notions at all. We can find out how far the understanding can extend its view, how far it has faculties to attain certainty, and in what cases they can only judge and guess, when they learn to content themselves with what is attainable by us in the state. Very good. So that's one thing to keep in mind. <coughs> what? Another volunteer wants to read? All right, let me show you. This is look on the middle right on 317. Um, so that... Um, Let's start here in the, almost in the middle of the page where he says, men may find matter sufficient. And I might interrupt you to stop, but just keep reading. Okay. Men may find matter sufficient to busy their heads and employ their hands with uh, variety, delight, and satisfaction if they will not boldly quarrel with their own constitution and throw away the blessing their hands are filled with because they are not big enough to grasp everything. We shall not have much reason to complain of the narrowness of our minds if we will only employ them about what may be of use to us, for of that they are very capable. And it will be an unpardonable as well as childish peevishness 
if we undervalue the advantages of our knowledge and neglect to improve it to the ends for which it is given to us, because there are some things that are set out of the reach of it. It will be no excuse to an idle and untoward servant who would not attend his business by candlelight to plead that he does not have broad sunshine. The candle that is set up in us shines bright enough for all our purposes. The discoveries we can make with this ought to satisfy us, and we shall then use our understandings right when we entertain all objects in that way in proportion that they are suited to our faculties, and upon those grounds they are capable of being proposed to us, and not per the require demonstration and demand certainty where probability only is to be had and which is sufficient to govern, govern all our concerns. And that's good. Okay. And there's probably only like a couple sentences left, but yeah. that's, that's really good. And one other thing, you can see the upcoming questions here that you should be thinking about. How does Locke's assessment of the extent of human knowledge differ from Descartes and Leibniz? And what do you think this tells us? what to expect from Locke's account of human knowledge. But let's get this one last thing. Let's turn the page to 318. Can I get another volunteer to do that? Thank you, Amanda. And I think I want you to read all of section 6. So okay. All of section 6. Knowing the extent, extent of our cap capacities will hinder us for useless cur curiosity, skepticism, and idleness. We know that our own strength, we shall not know better what to undertake with hopes of its success. And we have well surveyed the powers of our own minds and make some estimate of what we may expect for them. We shall not incline either to sit still and not to set our thoughts on work at all in despair of knowing anything nor on the other side questioning everything and disclaim all knowledge. Because some things are not to be understood. It is great use of the sailor to know the length of his line, though he cannot fathom all depths of the, the ocean with it. It is well he knows that it is long enough to reach the bottom at such places that are necessary to direct his voyage and caution him against running upon shoals that may ruin him. Our business here is not to know all things, but those which concern our conduct, if we can find out those measures by which rational creature, put it in that state in which man is in this world, may ought to govern his opinions and actions depending theorem, we need not to be troubled that some other things escape our knowledge. Very good. Now think especially, that's a beautiful passage here about the the, the sailor and the line, knowing the depth of his line, the previous passage about the candle and the light. What is Locke generally saying here about uh, human knowledge, about what, what he's up to? And how does this contrast even maybe a little bit, if you can see the connections, uh, with what especially Descartes was doing? Yeah, well, I would like to say that he's suggesting that human knowledge is only a, only so much can be attained by one person, um, versus when Descartes and Leibniz they just discussed all knowledge and how that is attainable. Um, I feel like Locke's only focusing on the amount of knowledge one person can attain based on their maybe I want to say career, I'm not using the right word, but based on the things that surround them, they mm -hmm. only know so much about that. Like, yeah, that's like, good. And what we said so far. So. Yeah, that's really good. Nope. Um, just to add on to that thing that he's saying that that's all right for our purposes of understanding human knowledge. Like we don't know have to know how, we don't have to worry about knowing everything ever. We just we we already possess the uh, faculties we need to understand what we need to know. Yeah, and maybe the key thing here is about this like need to know. You've got what you need for your purposes. Um, Good. Other thoughts on how to make sense of some of these passages or observations you have from these things that they're saying about the nature of our understanding? Yeah. I think he's a little more down to earth than the other two. The other two are kind of talking like 
sort of crazy. And he's just kind of like. And what was crazy, perhaps, about like what Descartes was up to? Um, some of it was just kind of far fetched, I guess. And one reason for that might be because Descartes said, in order to n to really know something, it has to be certain. You have to have that absolute in absolute certainty. It has to be no room for doubt. Locke is saying something a little different here. He's saying, well, human reason has limits, and we might not be able to know everything, and perhaps he's going to say, well, you don't have to be absolutely certain, you just have to know it so well for our purposes. And to set the standard for knowledge so high is essentially to make it unattainable. So maybe what Locke is saying here is that we should not make the standard for knowledge so high that human beings can't attain it. Um, rather, we just need to set it high enough to where it meets our purposes, to where it's useful for what we need to accomplish. Um, and also, there's a recognition that we don't need to know everything. Descartes was going to try to prove that there was a God, that we have an immortal soul, that we, um, you know, all of these kinds of big things, that we'll have this perfect foundation for the sciences. Locke is saying, well, maybe there are just going to be things out of our reach. Maybe we won't be able to prove all of that, but let's just prove the stuff we need to have for our purposes. The fisherman, or the sailor, doesn't need to have a line that goes all the way down to measure the depths of the ocean. Why, anybody know why a sailor would need some kind of line to tell how deep the water is? Yeah? So when he's sailing, he doesn't like run up on land in the middle of the ocean or like going through a bay or something. Right. So all you need is a line that's long enough to make sure that it would give you enough warning and enough understanding of the depth so you're not going to run your ship aground. You don't need a line that's going to tell you how deep the ocean is at any depth. You just need it for your to it would tell you this much. Maybe what he's saying is that God has equipped us with enough understanding not to know everything, but just to know the stuff we need to know. So I think this is a very different kind of perspective on human knowledge. We'll see how this plays out. Um, take a look on... 318, in the middle of that page, we don't necessarily have to read this out loud, just take a look at section 8, chapter 1 there. Um, somebody tell me, what does Locke mean by the term idea? Like the most common word he uses throughout the whole essay, this is where he defines it, so we have to be clear. <coughs> Anyone find it, even if you don't know what it means? Understanding when a man thinks. The object of the understanding when a man thinks. So, here's one way to think about this. It's whatever it is that you can think about. Whatever is an object of thought. So this could have, one of the most obvious things this could apply to it would be a belief. But it could also apply to your to just an experience or a sensation. It could apply to a feeling that you have when you think about it. Pretty much anything that you can entertain as a thought is an idea. Questions about that? So What we're going to move on to now is chapter 2. So chapter 1 is just kind of the setup for the book, letting us know that he, what he's aiming to do, and letting us know that he, he thinks that the scope of human knowledge is not unbounded, but has limits. In the second chapter, what we're going to be trying to do is show that there are no innate ideas. 
Um, in Locke's day, the existence of innate ideas was widely accepted, due largely to the influence of Descartes and the Cambridge Platonists. These guys uh, that I may have mentioned in passing and setting up some of the background of some of the other readings we've done. So, an innate idea is supposed to be an idea that you're born knowing. You don't acquire it through experience. It's just something that has always been in your mind since birth. Some traditional examples of innate ideas would be something like this, that no part is greater than the whole. Whatever is, is. Nothing can both be and not be at the same time in the same way. That the sum of the interior angles of a triangle are equal to two right angles. These are ideas that many of these people, Descartes and, the, and these Cambridge Platonists, they thought you were born with these ideas stocked up in your mind, these ideas and more. Locke is going to argue that you can't believe this, that this doesn't really bear out. So, in section two of this part, Locke summarizes one of the more popular arguments of his day for innate ideas. Now, this is not Descartes' argument for innate ideas. Um, if you remember, the best argument maybe we got from Descartes on this was that wax argument from the second meditation. This argument is maybe better related to some of these other figures, Lord Herbert, Bishop Stillingfleet, and some of the Cambridge Platonists. And the argument that they put forward goes roughly like this. There are ideas that are universally agreed upon by all mankind. Well, if there are ideas that are generally agreed upon or universally agreed upon by all mankind, then innate ideas exist, and therefore innate ideas exist. The way to think about this argument is to kind of think, look, everybody seems to have a certain set of ideas in common. Like, everybody holds the belief that something cannot both be and not be at the same time. Like, well, that's the law of non-contradiction. It can't both be the case that something is and is, is not. So, what would explain how all of these people all have these same ideas? Well, it might be because these ideas are innate. So, since there are these ideas that everybody agrees upon, and it would you almost want to say that if that were the case, then it would have to follow that innate ideas exist. Therefore, innate ideas exist. That's the idea here. That's the argument. Before we get into Locke's criticism, does it make you, you don't have to agree with this argument, but do you kind of get the motivation for the argument? Do you see why somebody would think well, if everybody agrees to a certain set of ideas, one way to explain that would be through uh, thinking that these ideas are all innate, that we're all born with them. Yeah? Isn't it kind of just like a definition they're setting up, like saying innate ideas exist, therefore innate ideas exist? <laughs> Only if you think innate means universally agreed upon. All right. Because they don't, what they, they almost want to look at is the phenomena is more like, hey, we can, it is, like, we can look at all of humanity and tell everybody does agree to these things. You can't find people who, who reject these claims. So it must be the case... So then the next thing is, what explains the fact that it's all agreed upon? Well, because these ideas must have been in place since birth. Yeah? Like, how does anybody know that everybody agrees with it? Well, this is maybe going to take us then into Locke, because Locke, one of the things he wants to say... Well, he wants to say that both of these premises are unfounded. And so, let's go ahead and look at these, then. Locke is going to argue that both premises of that argument are false. So the first premise, um, he says, is false because, and this maybe is actually related more to what you might, what, what would relate to where this conversation was about to go with, with Alex, which is, if the idea, just because the ideas are universally agreed upon, it doesn't follow that they have to be innate. There might be, in other words, there could just be another way in which everybody gets these same ideas. What if we all just have the same set of common, for lot, common experiences? And these common experiences are the basis by which we form innate ideas. Or uni these ideas that are universally accepted. So it's a larger set. That's what yeah. So we'll talk, 
when we move, we're actually going to talk about maybe how this works in a moment. But maybe the bigger thing that I see him putting more stock in is the second premise being false, which I think speaks maybe more to, to what Bridget was saying, which is that he says that these ideas are not known to young children in what he calls idiots. Now, what he says, what he claims are idiots here are people that are mentally challenged. And I don't think that at this time, the word idiot was probably actually a proper technical term for referring to these people. Um, and then over time has become a pejorative word. So I don't think he's throwing, I don't think he's calling people names. Um, I think he's just being very, he, he, he's using what would be the proper clinical term of his time. Um, to think about this, I, the second critique here, this is what you have to think if you believe in innate ideas. You have to think that when little infants and babies are, are born, in their mind is the very thought of these innate ideas. These innate ideas are in their minds from birth. So, the little baby is <laughs> sitting there in the crib going goo goo ga ga, but in the mind, what is the child thinking? Nothing can both be and not be at the same time. The interior, the sum of the interior angles of a triangle equal to right triangle. I've got right now a child that's almost three years old and one that is like nine months old. I I love my children. I think they're pretty smart for their age. Um, do I think that my nine-month-old has these ideas in her mind? No. If you believe, though, like Descartes, that we have innate ideas, you would have to think that even at birth, depending on your view of persons, maybe at conception, that person has these ideas floating around in their mind. They have these thoughts. But it doesn't seem like, it seems, pretty, seems pretty far-fetched to say the baby is thinking these very mature thoughts. So that's essentially what Locke is saying is wrong with the second premise, that you have to attribute to babies, infants, and then people who are um, you know, mentally challenged that they have these kinds of mature thoughts that we don't really see any evidence for. Um, now, the rest of what we get from Book 1, Chapter 2 is essentially him answering objections to this uh, line of reasoning. So one thing somebody might say is, look, the ideas are innate in these children. They're just not known to the children. So that my nine-month-old really does have the ideas, but my nine-year-old just doesn't know what they are. And then as they grow up, they're able to sort of get in contact with those ideas that are implanted in their mind from birth. Well, Locke says that this idea is just completely contradictory. And, uh, so the way Locke puts that is that an unknown idea is a contradiction. To have an idea is to know it. So you can't, to say that you've got ideas but you don't know what they are is a contradiction. What else could you mean that you have ideas but you don't know what they are? If you've got the idea, you've got to know what it is. So that's not going to work. Another objection that he considers in this section is that the capacity for the ideas is innate. So this is actually closer to what would be Leibniz's view, um, that the ideas themselves are not in the mind from birth. It's that um, you are born with the capacity for these ideas, and as you grow up and mature, uh, you're able to sort of unlock those capacities. What Locke wants to say in response to this is that that's just too broad. That would be too liberal of a definition of innate. Uh, because if, all you, if what you say is all you need is for the capacity in order for the idea to be innate, well then all of our ideas would be innate. Because we're born with the capacity for every idea that we have. You're born with the capacity to know that you know, I'm wearing, I guess you could call this green, a green tie. Um, was that innate knowledge? No. I mean, nobody would say that's innate. You are born with the capacity.
to know that you, uh, you know, that you would take a philosophy class on Wednesday night in the spring semester of 2014. Was that idea innate? No, nobody would say that's innate knowledge. So the fact that you have the capacity for that knowledge doesn't mean that the ideas that are obtained through it would be innate. So unless you're willing to say all of our ideas are innate, which nobody is willing to say, then it follows that you can't just say the capacity for the ideas innate makes the ideas themselves innate. So another kind of objection, I spread this out over sections, this is, I think, the moral of sections 6 to 16 here. So here I'm covering a lot of ground. Um, if you want to go over anything specifically in these sections, let me know. Um, what I think essentially the objection is, is that the ideas arise from the use of reason as opposed to experience. So since we acquire these ideas through reasoning and not through experience, it must follow that the ideas were innate, whereas everything else we acquire through experience. The bottom line for Locke here is to say something like this. Reason deduces truths from what is already known. Your reason doesn't generate new content. Your reason doesn't supply any new information that wasn't already there. So it's sort of like saying your mind gives you the idea of, you know, A, and your mind gives you the idea that if A, then, sorry, experience gives you the idea of A, experience then gives you the idea that if A, then B, therefore your mind deduces from that, well, B is the case. Well, that's not any new information. All that information was already sort of contained in the experience. Your mind just deduced truth from what was already known. You don't get anything really brand new out of reason. And for that reason, um, you can't claim to get, um, you can't claim that reason is sort of an original source of new content. Um, we're going to, we're going to see how this plays out actually later in the course, um, which is that Locke is going to say there's another way in which we can get these ideas. We don't have to get these ideas just... Um, I should put it this way. There's a, way to, there's a story to be told how we get these ideas through experience. And I'm going to... I know I have up here that we should read this section. I want to hold off on this because we're going to talk more about how this works later. Uh, any questions about how these, this line of reasoning goes? For any of you that have had me for intro, I think that you might recognize parts of this section, at least from our intro class. Yeah? Just a question. Um, is, is there like a difference in the way they're thinking of idea? Is it like, for example, the first one, I'm th sort of thinking that the people that believe in the ideas, they think them almost like parameters that you have when you're born, and he's thinking of them as something sort of different. Mm -hmm. So is, could, could there possibly be a, a difference in the definitions they're using for idea? That could be the case. The question would even be if you give like a more clear definition or you just get really clear about what do you mean, what are these maybe people who believe in innate ideas, what do they really mean? <coughs> I'm not sure that you're still going to come out of that Get, come out of this unscathed. Um, and I think that that is part of the issue. So most of the people who might be inclined to innate ideas would either go with something that would be like these first two things as why. So like you might come up with some kind of Freudian idea of psychology where there are parts of the self, there are parts of our mind that are obscure to us, that are unknown to us, that are hidden. Maybe you could say there's something like that going on, and so that's where the innate ideas are. They're in that part of the self that's unknown. Locke, I think, would just reply the exact same way to that. What do you mean by a self you don't know about? How could there be something that is you and you not know what it is? Um, and, and I think that more sophisticated uh, objections to like Freudian psychology almost go along these same kinds of line, the same line of reasoning. Other questions about this? I, 
I think that when you really look closely at what Locke is doing, this is ultimately really suggesting a direct argument against innate ideas. So here's a variation on that argument from universal consent. I've changed the claims considerably, though. So here's the way to think about this. The first claim would be to say, look, if innate ideas exist, then wouldn't it follow that there would be ideas that are universally agreed upon by all people? That seems to be right. Because if there are, if innate ideas really did exist, everybody should have those ideas. They're, you shouldn't think that some people got them and some people don't. But, based on what we just looked at, Locke says, well, but there are no ideas that are universally agreed upon to all mankind. And since that would follow if innate ideas exist, guess what? It's not the case that innate, innate ideas exist. Given what he's ju we've just gone over and very quickly in these past few slides, it seems like if you if you don't if you want to go along with Locke on those claims, you shouldn't just say there's no good reason to believe in innate ideas. You should actually come to this conclusion. There's positively good reason to think that innate ideas do not exist. And what do y'all think? What do y'all think about that? Is there anybody that, that's holding out four innate ideas that would like to make a run at Locke here? I'll be nice. Yeah? Um, I don't, I agree with him in that, but then there's like, what if you were to say like, like everyone agrees upon that there's a sun? That like we're on Earth or something. So this would be kind of interesting, which would then be, because do you think that those should count as innate ideas? That the sun exists? That we're on planet Earth? I think so. To me, it's an idea, I guess. Locke would agree that probably all conscious, sentient, ration, rational beings hold these beliefs. But the question is, where do you get those beliefs from? Did you get them because you were born with them, or did you get them because you learned them through experience? Locke would say those are better explained by saying we get it through experience and learning. Not that it's just something that we, that we are just born knowing. Yeah? I'm just curious how Locke would respond to you would consider like uh, if, uh, basic human needs as an idea, you know what I mean? Like uh, instinct type deals. Yeah. So one kind of example. You didn't think about hunger, so it's clearly an idea. You're born being hungry, so that, I mean, you know what I mean? Like, mm -hmm. it's, like it's bordering something. A, maybe a, a slightly better example might be like when a newborn is born, you don't have to teach a newborn how to nurse. A newborn baby just knows how to do it. Um, would that be an example of an innate idea? Something that is not learned through experience, but they're just born knowing. It looks like it. Um, I think this is how Locke would respond. He would say... Old, that would only be an example of an innate idea if the child conducted that behavior through like thought and reasoning as opposed to just like reflex. Um, reflex responses are not thoughtful, they're not conscious, they're not intentional. They don't involve the use of the mind. So I didn't know this, um, but as a kid, I would go like to the doctor's office and they'd check your reflexes, you know, you're supposed to just kind of hang a limb and they take a little hammer and hit your reflexes. I thought the whole thing was just to tell if I could feel the hammer. So anytime the doctor hit it, I just kick. Um, lucky me, I guess my reflexes were just fine. But um, when the doctor hits your reflex joint on your knee and you kick, it's not because of some idea in your mind that you do it. It's just a response. Locke would likely say, unless you can prove otherwise, Young children, like newborns who do these kinds of things, it's just reflex responses. No thought needed. Any other defenses of innate ideas anyone wants to try? Uh, 
Um, or any other questions at this point? So at this point, we covered actually a lot of the reading. Um, if there's any passage in there you would like me to clarify or engage with that you thought was difficult or that you were curious about, or if there was just some observation you had, here's your. This is your time. Yeah. So as the, as in my head, um, you said about reflexes um, that they aren't ideas. So what if the I don't I guess I don't have a word for it. What if the notion that something can be and not can't be and not be yeah. that's more of a reflex of your mind rather than an idea. Well, in that case, this is different because when we use like the law of non-contradiction, we use it in thought. It's not just like if somebody says hey, I would like you to both, you know, exist and not exist, that you just as a reflex response say, illogical. <laughs> you think about it, hopefully not for too long, and you say, hey, that's impossible because that violates the law of non-contradiction. And so that wouldn't just be a reflex response, that would be actually you using the content of thought to arrive at some idea. Arguably, when a computer engages in what you might so this might be as controversial. I'll say, let's call it reasoning in quotes. When a computer engages in reasoning, it doesn't, arguably, it is doing a reflex response. It is not actually engaging in conscious thought and entertaining the content of the beliefs and then giving you some rational um, conclusion that was the result of the thought process. It is just reflex responses. Mm -hmm. I'm just wondering what you would say, like, like, like Will said with the word instinct, what would he say that is? Like, cause like I know it's not human, but say like mm -hmm. a salmon is born in the river and it swims downstream into a lake. Right. It knows that it can't swim back up until three to five years later, and then it swims back up to like within the ideal spot that it was born originally. So is, would he consider that or like a reflex? He would have to say one of two things: either that it's a reflex, or that it you, or that the fish can actually learn that through some kind of like it gets the ideas through experience. If ultimately <coughs> these kinds of cases get too hard to explain, then maybe he's, there's a problem with his philosophy. Although what he might ultimately say is, well, what makes you think animals can think at all? I mean, we love the, we love the furry creatures, but maybe they're not. Maybe you're attributing too much consciousness and thought to them. He'd, want, he'd probably want to stick to human things. Let's go ahead and take our first break here, and let's come back when our clock says, let's say, 6.32. Give me a chance to re reboot here. Thoughts people came up with over the over the break that you wanted to have straighten out about innate ideas here with Locke. If you want a sense in which Locke was very influential, after he wrote this book, um, at the, I should put it this way, at the time when he wrote the book, lots of people believed in innate ideas in England. After he wrote this book, the English-speaking world became very skeptical of innate ideas and widely has rejected it. Meanwhile, people on the continent in Europe, like Descartes and Leibniz and Spinoza and some of these other folks, were so influential that people on the continent were very sympathetic and encouraging of believing in innate ideas. So that was a big intellectual divide in the two. The people on the European continent embracing innate ideas. The British reject them, and for the most part, the, their, pro, their intellectual progeny, us Americans, are very skeptical of them as well. So this takes us then now from book one to book two. Book two is now the positive account of his view of knowledge. So if you think about it this way, book one is the is just saying what is not the case. It's a negative account. It's not the case that ideas come innately. So what he needs to do now in book two is give us a positive account. Where do the ideas come from? This is called his account is called empiricism. And empiricism 
is the view that the most fundamental source for the origin of all of our thoughts and ideas come from experience. And this is supposed to be a contrast with the rationalism we've been looking at that would come through Descartes and Leibniz. Descartes and Leibniz taught that the most fundamental source for our ideas comes through innate reason. Locke, no. Experience. I'm going to break this up into groups and we're going to answer some questions. All right, um, I'm actually not going to answer these directly right now. We're going to go through most of these through what follows next. If there's anything that we want to talk about with these, stop me and make sure that we talk about them. Um, I hope that this group work also helps you find ways to realize that some of the readings, to some degree, not in every way, you can make sense of if you spend some time on them um, and, and working with them in, in a group like this. Um, so Locke tells us that the source of all of our ideas, and on his view of empiricism, I mean like absolutely everything that is in your mind comes through experience. That when you're born, you are born with nothing in the mind. Completely a blank slate. And then through your experiences, you fill up that slate with stuff. And it's almost like, they use the example sometimes of like a wax tablet. And what the empiricists would even seem to say is like, you're born like this plain wax tablet with nothing on it. But literally as you have the experiences, the, the experiences imprint on your mind. He uses that word imprint a lot. Like it's like pressing into the wax and forming the ideas in your mind. So that your, your experiences almost uh, like press upon your mind um, all these new ideas. Now he says that there are two sources of experience. One is sensation, the other is reflection. Um, what, somebody tell me about sensation. What, is, what does he mean by sensation? I don't know, you just took up our paper. Yeah, Vince. You refer to the senses? We perceive the senses? Yeah, so sensation refers to what I, I will call it outward experience experience from sort of the outside of yourself, and we most commonly associate this with our five senses. Um, the idea is that you get through things by the way that they look, smell, taste, touch, and so on. Um, and so that's one kind of experience, it's the kind of experience we most correct, we identify with, I think, most easily. What's this other kind of experience he talks about? Reflection. Zach. Um, they di it directs it directly relates with sensation, except it's more of a like it's an internal thing. It's how you experience those senses and how you um, act on them. So this would be like you said, it's an internal kind of experience, and maybe another word that we might put this is it's like an introspective experience. It's not the experience of things on the outside; it's the experience of your own thoughts and ideas and. And I would go on to add feelings and other things like this into here. So that Locke would say, here are the two ways that we get new ideas. One, we get them through outward experience. And secondly, we get them through reflection and this sort of inward experience. This inward experience, reflection is needed because we have ideas about things like ideas. How do you know what an idea is? You don't experience an idea with your five senses. Well, you get the idea of an idea by reflecting on what's going on in your mind. Um, like I said, I would put into this also things like feelings. H how do you know what happiness is? Or how do you know what um, depression is? How do you know what hunger is? All of that, I think, would also come from reflection. You don't really get those from an outward sense. You get them because you, ex you have those ideas because you've experienced them. Any questions about sensation and reflection? The, if Locke is right, the beauty of the system is this, that you get all of your ideas, everything that is in your mind comes from these two sources, and that's it. So it's a very, in a way, I mean, elegant and simple system. 
You get everything that you know, either because you experienced it or because you reflected on that and through introspective ex uh, experience you, you know what that is. We could, looking through this part of the text, this might be a little artificial, but I think there are two arguments for empiricism that we can derive from this. So one of these comes from section five. This is actually in the bottom half of that paragraph or that section about children. This wasn't the primary thing I wanted you to take out of that paragraph, although it's something you could take from that um, when I had you do that in your small groups. So Locke says, um, these, when we have taken a full survey of them and their several modes, combinations, and relations, we shall find to contain all our whole stock of ideas and that we have nothing in our minds which did not come in one of these two ways, referring to sensation and reflection. So what, basically, what does that mean? You cannot find an idea that did not come from experience. So here's a way you could falsify Locke's theory. Can you come up with some idea that did not originate from experience in some way? Is there any thought that you have that cannot be traced to an experience? Let me ask you, do you think Locke is right about this? Or can you come up with an idea or some thought or something in your mind that is not traceable to experience? What would Locke say about the idea of God? We will read about the idea of God when we get to this part later. The short story is, he wants to say that we derive our idea of God through experience. That you have the idea of persons because of your experience, and then you just sort of say God is like a person, but more so. You know, he's more powerful, more wise, more good than any of you. So. Yeah? I know we're going to read on this, but what, like, the idea, what if God isn't a personal being? Then... You would, whatever you think, whatever concept you come up with God would once again have to be derivable from these other parts of your experience. If you say, if you think God is like a force, so usually that the model for an impersonal God would be like a force, say, well, maybe you've got some idea of force independently, and then you extrapolate other qualities about force and say that's what God is like. Other thoughts? Uh, anybody come up with anything else that might be difficult, or you're just curious how he does it? Yeah. Is experience, like, that can be an indirect, you could be, like, indirectly experiencing things. Like, let's say you have a fear of being attacked by bees, or mm -hmm. something like that. You didn't experience that, at, you never actually were, were attacked by bees, but, like, maybe you saw it in a, a TV show mm -hmm. or something like that, so is it, like, an indirect experience that... Yeah. You to think that so way. if like you read a story or saw a movie or something like that, maybe there's a sense in which uh, you sort of get certain ideas through reading or through experiencing a movie or something like that. You would be fine with that. Okay, so it doesn't have to be necessarily a personal experience. It could be like it doesn't actually have to happen to you in that sense. Like it could be right. an indirect thing. Okay. I mean, in a way, when you read a really good novel, it causes you to have a little bit of those experiences or the feelings and the ideas. Um, you know, when you read a really good story told in the first person, um, you almost feel, you almost, you almost go through those same experiences as that character. And even so, you might get like nervous and scared when the character is nervous and scared. So that would all be consistent with what Locke is saying. Um, the second argument, this is actually what I was saying about the section on the child, so I got that mixed up in my mind. So this is the end of that thing on the children in section six. Um, Locke puts forward this kind of thought experiment that says, imagine that a child were kept in a place where he never saw any other but black and white until he were a man. He would have no more ideas of scarlet or green than he who from his childhood never tasted an oyster or a pineapple has it of those relishes. So what Locke is kind of saying here is that if you had a child who was capable of seeing colors, but for whatever reason was just only exposed to black and white, that child would not be able to conjure up in his mind like the color red or green until he had the experience. Um, the same thing would go for somebody who, suppose you've never had pineapple. Or maybe you know somebody who's never had pineapple. 
Do you think that they could just conjure up the idea of what that tastes like if they've never had the experience? Most likely, I would say the answer is no. Somebody who's born blind, do they have the idea of what a color is? Somebody who's born deaf, do they have the idea of what sound is? It seems like what Locke is pointing out in all these, in, in these kinds of cases and the ones I'm adding is that experience is necessary for having certain ideas. You take away the experience, you take away the ideas. That seems to make a very strong case for saying, where do the ideas come from? They're coming from experience. So for these kind of two reasons, you can't come up with an idea that you can't trace back to experience. And secondly, it, <clears throat> it certainly seems like you need to have the experiences to have the ideas. This is building a stronger case for the way in which um, experience, his view of empiricism is right, that you need to have, that experience is the source for all of our thoughts. Now there's this interesting part that takes place next where um, Locke starts talking about dreaming. You might be saying, what's going on with all this? We're going to hopefully bring that full circle at the end of this section here. Um, Descartes, if you remember, believed that the essence of the mind or the soul is to think. But Locke says the soul doesn't always engage in thinking. This is one of the, the questions I had for your groups, which is to kind of go into, why doesn't Locke think... So why does Locke think that the soul doesn't always engage in thought? Um, if nothing else, it seems like we can have a dreamless sleep. Periods where... We literally have no thoughts at all. It's just nothing. So what Locke would say is that thinking is not the essence of the soul or the mind. That's what Descartes said. The mind's essence is to be a thinking thing. But somebody like Locke is coming around and says, well, if that's what the essence of the mind is, then the mind would always have to be engaged in thought. If the mind wasn't engaged in thought, at some time it would cease to be the mind. So... Instead, Locke says that thinking is just a power or one of the abilities of the soul or the mind. But it's not the essence of the soul or the mind. If there were the essence of it, it would always have to be doing it, and it doesn't always do it. Um, this leads to an interesting puzzle about personal identity, this, this thing about Castor and Pollux. Maybe before I get to Castor and Pollux, were there any thoughts about what he was saying about uh, the soul or the mind may not think. This is also going to be a topic of one of the uh, women philosophers that we're going to look at later in the course. So, Locke says, suppose one person, while awake, has certain ideas. When they go to sleep, their soul has certain ideas, dreams. But the first person, he doesn't remember any of these ideas. So what does Locke want to say about this person? Um, what is going on with this business about, about all that? Yeah. It's two different people. That's right. He wants to say that the person who is awake is not the same person who is asleep. Um, there was like a TV show, I, don't know, I never watched, I don't know what happened to it, where the premise of the show is like one, one person has certain experiences when they're awake and then when they go to sleep they have experiences like of being a completely different person. Um, and then, although the weird thing with that one is that, the, that he remembers both. So imagine what would happen if when you go to sleep Someone, like, there's a whole nother consciousness, a whole nother train of thought that takes place that is um, disconnected in, from your current consciousness. Locke is going to say, well, then there's two different people. So, um, let's, let's go ahead and take a look at this passage here. Um, this is on 326, 327. Um, Alright, 
So he says, for it is all together, this is starting in about five or six lines from the bottom, for it is all together as intelligible to say that a body is extended without parts as that anything without being conscious of it or perceiving that it does so. They who talk thus, thus may, with as much reason if it is necessary to their hypothesis, say that a man is always hungry, but that he does not always feel it, whereas hunger consists in that very sensation as thinking consists in being conscious that one thinks. If they say that a man is always conscious to himself of thinking, I ask, how do they know it? Consciousness is the perception of what passes in a man's own mind. Can another man perceive that I am conscious of anything when I perceive it not myself? No man's knowledge here can go beyond his own experience. So what is, um, you know, what is he saying here about, um, actually, did I read the right passage here? Why did I have this page about, sorry. Now I'm getting curious about what I was doing here. Oh, I know what I'm probably meant to do. Sorry. What I probably meant to say is it's the, it's what's the spans, the columns on 326. Um, or maybe I meant, anyway. Now, sorry, it's, this is where my notes can drive me a little bit off the, the right path. 12 is about um, on page 325 yeah. bottom of that column. That's what I want to talk about. I think it's 325, 326. I'm not going to read all this again because I don't want to <laughs> go through all that again. But in your groups, many of you looked at this thing. And the point here is that if you have one consciousness and another consciousness that are disconnected from one another, that don't remember each other, that's like having two persons. Yeah. Kind of like schizophrenic. Like schizophrenia is like dual personality disorder. In a way, if it was kind of weird. It's like you don't remember well, I mean, I don't know about every case, but like there'll be like one person in one moment and then their brain like switches them over to another person. And, and if the two people don't interact, if the two minds, if you will, the two personalities have no awareness of one another, then I mean it makes perfect sense that they're two persons. Yeah. That's what Locke would say is the natural and obvious result that he thinks is actually the right result to say here. It's the other person who's saying, no, it's one person here that has a harder case. So what he's, what he's saying makes the same person across time has to do not with having the same body. We're going to see this later. It's not being the same soul, but it's having the same consciousness. We're going to talk about that when we read, I think, this part 359 to 367 next time. More on this later. This is really, I think this is one of the more interesting and exciting parts of Locke's philosophy. That's kind of cool. So, what I just read actually in, ended up reading aloud was this business about saying, well, the, the soul does not, the soul may not be, it's, how do you know that you're not having thoughts all the time? So one of the things that, that Locke would say is that you can't prove that we're having thoughts all the time. And in fact, he would go so far as to say, when I look at my own experience, I catch myself quite often just having no thoughts at all. You ever just been sitting there, like, you know, eating your dinner or something, and you know, this happens, like, you're on a date or something, and, you know, first you're on a date, with says, what you thinking about? Like, <laughs> Uh, uh, nothing, you know, and you're like, you know, b being honest, like, isn't that, doesn't that happen? Or are you constantly thinking thoughts? Is it always the case that you're, you have a thought before your mind? You ever been sitting in a classroom and then teacher calls on you and sort of like, whoa, I wasn't, I didn't have any thoughts, I was just kind of like, you know, in a daze. Is it possible for you to have no thoughts? Locke says not only is it possible, but it's actual. And if nothing else, just thinking about the idea that you could be in a, in a sleep where you don't have any dreams would prove that you can go into periods where your mind doesn't think at all. And can't you argue that meditation would do just that? I mean, you repeat a mantra over and over until your thoughts aren't there. And you just it, 
Exactly. I mean, especially in the East, I mean, this is the whole point of meditation is to try to empty yourself of all thought, and certain people claim to achieve that. So, you might, first of all, this is, this relates to Descartes, right, because we all know Descartes' famous claim that what makes the soul what it is is that it thinks. If Locke is right, then that proves Descartes wrong, which is that the essence of the soul must not be to think. It must include more things, because the soul can exist even if it's not entertaining thoughts. But why does this relate to Locke's empiricism? Well, the key thing here is that it shows that the soul is not generating new ideas apart from experience. This whole business about sleep that takes place here and dreaming is all to show that you're not secretly like getting new ideas while you're dreaming or something like that. He wants to say, he wants to sort of guard against any possibility that somehow you're like secretly getting new ideas from your mind when you least expect it. All right, let me pause here for a moment and just say, any questions about this or any of the group work you just did that I did not address? Well, I actually we were just talking about this in our group. Can't, the, I know we wouldn't like to call it, can't you just say that if you're not having thoughts, then you just cease to exist during that time? You could, but this is the thing, is Descartes doesn't think that like your, he thinks of your soul as a <coughs> substance. So that means that you're, you're, the substance is not like the substance like pops into existence and then pops out of existence. So if you if you want to say well you just cease to exist, then you'd have to have the idea that you're that when you're when you have when you cease to think, not just that the soul is like turned off, but that it like ceases to exist altogether. And then when you start thinking again, it like pops into existence. And Descartes doesn't want that. He wants the soul to be there all the time. Okay. So. It, but in a similar thought process, not exactly to parts, could it, could, could it not be contradictory? You could do that, <coughs> in which case you have a now maybe another task, which would be to say, is it the same soul every time? If it's always falling out of existence and coming into existence, is it the same one or not? And if you say it's not the, s if you say it's the same one, you say, oh, how can it be? It's being constantly destroyed and created anew. Right. And if you say it's not, then how is it like entertaining the same ideas? Have it, there, why is there this continuity of thought that can take place still? One of my students in another class where I'm teaching this got really upset, well not upset, but she ar was arguing pretty strongly in Descartes' favor saying that you know contemporary psychology actually bears Descartes out saying that you know people are dreaming even if you don't remember it, which is the sort of thing that Locke was saying was like impossible. I don't know if anybody feels strongly about that in here. Yeah? I would probably agree with that uh, because psychology would say that the mind is always processing or thinking or doing something and it's never just completely inactive even during sleep, even in like the deepest sleep, so I guess that would, that's where I kind of got hung up a little bit when it came to the argument of sleeping and no conscious thought happening. Well, I was going to say, don't we only dream during REM sleep, <coughs> stage four of the processes of sleep, so what's going on in the other mm -hmm. stages of sleep? Anybody, and how do psychologists know that we are dreaming when we don't remember we're dreaming? So you're right. I mean, there's so you. One thing to think about is that maybe the dreaming only takes place in certain stages. But uh, I mean, how do psychologists know you're dreaming? It, well, it seems as though what Locke would say is he, he kind of in the definition that he uses of things, it requires um, it requires that one must necessarily be conscious of the different perceptions within like the idea of being able to. So it just kind of seems contradictory to having thoughts and not being conscious at that point. It seems like, his, by his definitions... It was, yeah. yeah. So by his definition, to have a thought is to be conscious of it. So that very idea of an unconscious dream or an unconscious thought is a, is a contradiction in itself. Yeah. Although, I mean, if you really pressed him on this, he just would have to say, well, maybe if there was conscious awareness of dreams but you don't remember it, then that's just a whole other person happening. It's not you.
It doesn't help you learn anything through your dreams, if that's what we're trying to talk about here with innate ideas. Yeah? I think if you if you side with the whole psychology says that um, even if you're not conscious of it, you're dreaming or you're sleeping, then I think you would have to look at the psych like or yeah, the psychology behind meditation because that could save this argument because that could be an example of one. It would be very interesting. I hadn't, no student has actually brought this up before, so I haven't thought about this much myself, but that I think would be a very interesting study. Yeah. Let's go ahead and take uh, a little break here. Yeah, all right. Oh, I could ask that. Please. Let's come back and pick up that thought, and then uh, we'll be back when the clock says, let's just say like 7.30, let's say 7.37. Um... And Phil was formulating a question I rudely interrupted. Um, I was just going to bring up a question. Uh, I'm sure everyone had the experience that when they wake up from a dream, they say, oh my God, I can't believe we just, I just had that dream. And then 10 seconds later, they forget all about it. Mm -hmm. Maybe it could be the case that we just do that with all our dreams that we have all the time. And then so that we're just immediately forgetting them. Yeah, yeah. And I think there's something maybe that, that to be said about this, that if you really want to remember a dream, I've been told, like, the, you need to write it down, talk, tell somebody about it. Uh, if you don't do it right away, you're going to forget it. Maybe one could try to argue that dream we could remember our dreams if we work on it or something like that. The question would be, would that still prove that we think all the time? Yeah. Wouldn't... Wouldn't the whole thing about like remembering dreams and things like that, would that would directly relate to memory, not so much so consciousness or thought? So I guess like I guess that's kind of where I get stuck with the whole like oh you forget if like if you forget a dream or if you remember it, it's like I still kind of feel like you're thinking either way, even if you're remembering or not remembering it. And like memory is kind of a different substance would would Locke agree that like memory isn't directly related to like our thought process or it, it kind of depends. Like I think that he would want to say that there it's not a necessary connection, there can be connections through memory. Okay. So you could have multiple thoughts and not necessarily remember all of them. But the thing this is what he's ultimately trying to get at is that what makes you the same person across time is sort of a collection of remembered experiences. Okay. I guess I have more on this fun topic later. Yeah. Back to the, the mind coming in out of existence. Yeah. I have. Could it be argued that like let's say I, I'm thinking uh, in like the frames of like a, a computer program. I always have this, but um, you have a computer program running, right? And if you turn off the power, the computer program ceases to be. But you still have the hardware. That's like the foundation of the computer program itself. So you could turn it back on; it still is. So could it be argued that the foundation is still there, even though the concept is still gone? This would be kind of a different view. I mean, this is, there's a view like this out there. It's not a view that's held by Descartes. It's not a view held by Locke. It's probably not a view that really was popularized until within the last hundred years, which thinks of consciousness as sort of being a property of the brain, but not, but not being a substance. So that consciousness is sort of if you will, a feature of the kind of thing our brain is under the right circumstances. So it's sort of, it's more like the analogy you're kind of giving, which is that the brain is the hardware, and all when we go to sleep, it's just sort of like we turn off the machine in some ways, and then everything is still able to run just when the power comes back on. Um, it's a different view than what Locke is giving and than what Descartes is giving, but it's a view that, that I, I do think that there's some, uh, that people have today. Okay. And the key difference would be what you're describing would make consciousness a feature of like the brain, whereas these other people are trying to argue that okay. consciousness is like in a complete it is like a different thing. 
Other thoughts before we move on to the next section. This is um, essentially um, takes us all the way up to page 328 here. So all of chapter 1, book 2. Any questions about any of that? I feel like we move really quickly through a lot of dense text in here. I hope that my overview and what we do in class makes sense of this to everybody. Um, but if there are passages or things in here that I'm skipping over that you really don't know what to make of, I'd be happy to you know, go over some of that and bring clarity. Or if there were just interesting things in here you wanted to talk about that I didn't, just didn't give you the opportunity to, this is your chance. So let's talk then about book two, chapter two. And here he talks about the nature of simple ideas. Um, simple ideas are the most basic ideas that can be thought in isolation from other ideas. What does that mean? Actually, let me start with a complex idea. An apple is a complex idea. It's composed of several ideas. It's composed of the idea of redness, roundness, sweetness, and hardness. You take away, so what would be a simple idea? A simple idea would just be one of those things. The redness alone. The roundness alone. The hardness or the sweetness. Any of those things taken by itself is a simple idea. And if you think about it, your simple ideas are not composed of any other ideas. It's not like your idea of redness. When you think about like the, the bright color of red, that's just a very simple idea. There's no, it's not made up of anything else. Could you then say that a simple idea is sort of like the essence of a thing? Or is that? Not necessarily. Okay. It might be, I mean, these would be like the building blocks of how we think about things, like apples. So you wouldn't want to say, for instance, the essence of being an apple is to be red. Okay, because that would be more complex. Well, partly because we think apples can also be green. And there might be other okay. things that make something an apple. It's just, in this particular case, this one happens to be red. So the difference between simple and complex is that complex ideas are combinations of ideas. So, once again, an apple is a complex idea. Because it's, when you think about an apple, you're thinking about several ideas joined together. You're thinking of the unification of redness, roundness, sweetness, firmness, all of those in one. Whereas a simple idea is just the redness considered on its own, the hardness considered on its own. Um, simple ideas cannot be created or destroyed in the sense that, think, I don't mean this like metaphysically, I mean this like in the sense of how we acquire them. You can, you can only acquire those simple ideas through sensation and reflection. You're never going to get a new, simple uh, idea in, um, apart from experience. The implication for this, then, is that the only truly original part of human creativity consists in repeating, comparing, and combining simple ideas in a potentially infinite number of ways. So you, there's a sense in which Locke is saying you cannot have an original thought. You can't, this is the sense in which he means that, you can't think of a color that you've never experienced. So nobody can just sit back and dream up, you know, I just thought of a brand new color. No, you can't. You can't think of a new sound, like a new note, besides an, a sound or, you know, a note that you've already heard. Um, you can't think of, you know, a taste what something would taste like apart from all the tastes that you've had. The closest that you can do is you can join together other experiences you've had and sort of create combinations that maybe have never been combined before. But those combinations are going to be the results of uh, simple ideas that you got through experience. You didn't create the simple ideas. Um, so. One of the things that he points out is that you can't even imagine or conceive of some idea or quality um, associated with an object besides those that are associated with our five senses. Like you can't, this is what I was saying, where you can't think of a new color besides what you've already experienced. Some people, 
like this, some people are kind of put off by the thought that maybe we're not as creative and original as we would like to think we are. Locke. Um, this also is helpful for thinking about other things. So, one potential problem that people could raise for Locke's empiricism is that we can think about ideas we've never experienced, such as the idea of a golden mountain. Nobody has seen a mountain made of gold. But you have experienced you know, the idea of gold through simpler things, and you've experienced the idea of mountains. So where do we come up with an idea of a golden mountain? Well, it's a complex idea that we create. We don't create it brand new. We create it from the simple ideas we got to experience. Since we've already experienced gold and we've experienced mountains, we can just join those two ideas in our mind. Um, you know, we can think about purple dragons. Where did we get the idea of a purple dragon? You never experienced one, I hope. You get that through the same kind of process that you through. You have simple ideas like of lizards and of uh, you know winged creatures, and you're able to in your and, and purple things, and you're able to sort of extrapolate from these different ideas you do have. You can create out of those simple ideas a complex one that would be like a dragon. So, like, if you like looked up a picture of a purple dragon, like saw that picture of a purple dragon, that's technically not like experiencing like what one would look like. I don't know. Do you know what I mean? Like yeah. Instead of just picturing one in your head, actually like looking at another person's. So, if your first idea of a dragon came through like seeing a picture or a movie, mm -hmm. that would work. So the question would be, where did that guy come up with the idea of a purple yeah, dragon? But for you looking at it, that would be already. fine. Okay. In our day and age, we're able to we get all sorts of interesting ideas just through, you know, the internet and uh, movies. Mm -hmm. What about um, like <laughs> extending like the range of simple ideas? Like they have like um, like ultraviolet or infrared mm -hmm. colors. Is that I don't know how to really, how does that factor into this? Well, this is going to maybe come up in the next section we're going to look at, but in a way, we don't have I, we don't have direct ideas of like infrared color or ultraviolet color. That those are things that are not that we we don't know what those colors look like, right? Um, maybe some animals do. We um, still have like the idea of them, just not, not the color. That's right. So our idea of them is not really of them directly, it's more of them insofar as they cause our instruments to do certain things. We create devices that measure these things, and we say, oh, whatever, you know, ultraviolet does this on, you know, causes my instrument that measures wavelengths of light to register this way. So that's what ultraviolet is. Whereas when you talk about red, we don't typically think of red as, oh, it's that thing that causes this device to measure wavelengths of light a certain way. We say, no, I know what red is directly. Yeah. So. If you could, like, let's say, engineer someone so they could see more colors, mm -hmm. would that be considered having more simple ideas? Yeah, no. I, I, I think so. Because oh, right. I think they would have an ideas about like what ultraviolet colors are that we don't really know. Right. I mean, think about this. Compare your vision with somebody who's born colorblind. They might have some idea of like what red and blue and green are. Like, in terms of, I know stop signs are supposed to be red. Everyone tells me that. I know that, you know, red is supposed to be darker than pink. But they don't really know what red is in the same way you and I, if you're not colorblind, know what red is. Um, that would be the same analogy if we were able to create people, you know, genetically engineer or modify their eyes or something to where they can see ultraviolet. They would kind of be like, I know what, what ultraviolet colors are in a way you don't really know. So this takes us then to the topic of the difference between primary and secondary qualities. Um, so this is where we skip ahead to chapter 7 here. I had you skip over chapters 3, 4, 5, and 6. Um, so um, let's take a look at section 2 here. And I want, us to, I want you to be thinking about this question as we read through this. What does Locke mean when he writes, it being one thing to perceive and know the idea of white or black, 
and quite another to examine what kind of particles they must be and how arranged in the surfaces to make any object appear white or black. Um, so, um, make sure I get the, sorry, this should be, sorry, this should be chapter 8. I have this on the wrong thing. So look on 332. And I'm just going to read all section 2 there on 332. So he says, thus the ideas of heat and cold, light and darkness, white and black, motion and rest, are equally clear and positive ideas in the mind, though perhaps some of the causes which produce them are barely privations and subjects from which our senses derive those ideas. These the understanding and its view of them considers all as distinct positive ideas, without taking notice of the causes that produce them, which is an inquiry not belonging to the idea as it is in the understanding, but to the nature of the things existing without us. These are two very different things and carefully to be distinguished. It being one thing to perceive and know the idea of white or black, and quite another to examine what kind of particles they must be and how arranged in the surfaces to make any object appear white or black. So what, what are you getting out of this section? Um, it doesn't even necessarily have to be about this quotation, but what is he trying, what, what's he bringing out from, from, from this section we just read? Anybody have a guess? Think about the concept of like blackness. Do you have an idea of blackness? Do you you know that conjures up something in your mind if you want to think about it? Is blackness like is black something or is black the absence of something? How about this? This is kind of related to this. Do you have a concept of what a hole is? Do you have an idea of what a hole is? Is a hole, is, are holes something or are holes the absence of something? You have the idea of cold. Is coldness, once again, a something or is coldness the absence of heat? Um, Locke is concerned in this part that not all of the positive ideas we have correspond to positive things. Another example he uses in this part of the book, he talks about shadows. Shadows are not like substantial real things. Shadows are once again the absence of light. It's the absence of light that happens to trace, um, you know, the shape that blocks the light. You know, that's how we do it. Yeah. Yeah. See. So shadows are not something, they're the absence of light. How do we get, he's concerned that we get these positive ideas of things, like we positively have a concept of a whole, of darkness, of cold, of shadows. But that doesn't mean that our ideas necessarily correspond to something that really exists. So just having an idea about something doesn't tell you that that idea must correspond to some real existing thing. So what we need to do is reflect on this and figure out what, what, do our, what can we say about the nature, the fact that we have ideas, what can that tell us about reality? Just having an idea is not enough to tell us that it's real. We need to be able to think about which ideas correspond to reality or not, or how to analyze that relationship. Does that make sense? Just because you have an idea, you have an idea of what a hole is, that doesn't mean a hole is something. You have an idea of what space is. That doesn't make space something. Space might be the absence of things, right? So, for this reason that we have these ideas that may not correspond to actual existing things, or that may not correspond to positively existing things, 
We need to distinguish ideas as they exist in a person's mind and the qualities that exist in material objects that cause us to have these ideas. If we can make those distinctions, that will actually help us make sense of this problem. Um, and we will actually be able to, we won't fall into skepticism. It will help us understand the nature of the world and everything around us. So, all of this then is to say, let's think about qualities of objects. Look on section 8 on 333. This is another short one. I'm going to read this one in its entirety. And somebody pay attention and let me know, what is he, how does he define a quality? So, whenever the mind perceives in itself or is the immediate object of perception, thought, or understanding, that I call idea. And the power to produce any idea in our mind I call a quality of the subject in which the power is. Thus, a snowball having the power to produce in us the ideas of white, cold, and round, the power to produce those ideas in us as they are in the snowball I call qualities. And as they are sensations or perceptions in our understandings, I call them ideas which ideas, if I speak of sometimes, is in the things themselves, I would be understood to mean those qualities in the objects which produce them in us. So what's an idea? Or what's a quality? Mm -hmm. The power to produce an idea? A quality is the power to produce an idea in our mind. Sometimes... What Locke calls qualities, today we talk about properties. Um, and maybe this won't actually be a perfect fit, but let's roll with that for a moment. Which is to say, you know, there are properties of your book. Like your book, it's kind of rectangular. What do we mean when we say it's rectangular in Locke's sense? That means that this book has the power to produce in your mind, when you look at it, the idea of rectangularity. Um, the, uh, you know, a lot of you have, have drinks on your desk. All those things have all sorts of interesting qualities. They cause you to have ideas about the way they taste, the way they smell. Um, the bottles that they are held in have the power to produce nice the ideas about the shape of it, the way it feels. Um, so, a quality is just the power that something has to produce those ideas in our mind. He next distinguishes between primary qualities and secondary qualities. Primary qualities are those qualities that are in material objects and are utterly inseparable from them. So these are the ideas that they produce in us that describe the, act, the way that the objects are in themselves. So your book, when I say it's rectangular, that's a primary quality. It produces the idea of rectangularity, and it is a part of the substance of the book. It, you cannot, it's not separable from this book. Um, the fact that your book is a solid object is also a primary quality. That this book is a solid entity, you can't, you know, something can't pass through it. That idea is, that's produced in us describes the way the book is in its own self. You can't separate the solidity from the book. Um, he talks about motion being another one of these. Um, if the book hopefully is at rest, it's not moving, um, that is describing the nature of the book itself. It's not, um, it's, it's not illusory. Um, and number, what he means by that is like there, you have the idea there is one book here, not two or three or four. That the, uh, since there is, yet it forms in your mind the idea, one book, that is a description of that substance. In contrast to primary qualities, there are secondary qualities. Now, secondary qualities are qualities in objects that produce ideas in us. But you'll notice that these ideas that they produce in us are not in, the ideas are not in the, the, the substances. 
So these would include things like colors, sounds, tastes, scents. These are things that objects cause you to have ideas of, but they are not in the, these ideas are not really a part of the substances themselves. Let me see if I can illustrate it this way. Out in the world, this is a lemon. And when you, in, when you encounter a lemon in the right way, it causes you to form certain ideas about it. You form two kinds of ideas about the lemon. Primary ideas that are formed as a result of primary qualities and ideas that are formed as a result of secondary qualities. The ideas that you have of a lemon that are its primary qualities involve that kind of oval, spherical shape of it, that it is one entity, and in this case it's not moving. Those are all qualities that are, that are in the object itself. The lemon has those qualities, even if you're not around to experience them. It also produces these other kinds of qualities, like that the lemon is yellow, that the lemon is sour, that the lemon is firm. These are ideas it causes you to, to have, but these ideas are not in the lemon itself. These are ideas that only exist in your conscious experience of the lemon. That these ideas don't correspond to, a, to the reality of the lemon itself, it just corresponds to your experience experience of the lemon. So, <clears throat> color, so this is really interesting to think about, is that color is not a real feature of the world, according to Locke. Colors are more of like a psychological byproduct that we have because we encounter things in the world. But the world, in and of its true nature, if you were to encounter the world as it really exists, it would not be colored at all. After all, colors can change. Colors are different uh, on different lighting conditions. If we had different rods and cones in our eyes, we would see colors differently. Couldn't those <coughs> primary qualities change, though? Like, um, like, what if somebody, I mean, it's <coughs> obviously not very probable to happen, but never experienced a real, like, oval, spherical-shaped lemon. Like, they just only saw like a slice of one like mm -hmm. that you put on a, mm -hmm. like a cup or something like that and they have no idea of like of the any of the primary qualities yeah. like the shape could be changed or then what we'd say of the we, we would give us a similar kind of account but just of the wedge right so it would the shape would instead of being oval spherical shape it'd be that kind of like crescent um, you know wedge shape so would it still be a lemon though yeah I mean, we might get technical and talk it's maybe a part of a lemon or a piece of a lemon. Right. But in a way, that's not what... We don't, I don't want to focus too much on, like, Locke isn't thinking about, like, universal knowledge of lemonhood here. <laughs> He's thinking more about particular knowledge of, like, this thing in front of me. What is that particular thing? Oh, okay. All right. Yeah, yeah. But if you haven't ever, like, experienced the shape of, like, like a square for something else or a rectangle mm -hmm. in a book, then you wouldn't be able to then that wouldn't be able to be a primary quality for you. You know what I mean? But you would get it the minute that you have the experience. So Locke's not saying that you could conjure up any of this apart from experience. He's saying in the moment of experience, when you're looking at the object, this is what's going on. Is he saying that uh, primary qualities point to reality, whereas secondary point to our perception? Yes. Of so this is one thing that you should be we're, we should be moving to as we're thinking about that initial problem of like knowledge of like holes and darkness and cold is that he's trying to start to sift out how there are some things that describe the way things are in their real nature and then there are some things that are just sort of psychological byproducts of our experience and that we should attribute reality to the primary qualities and not attribute reality to the secondary ones yeah would the porous texture be a primary quality or a secondary quality, or could it be both? It depends on how you want to describe this. So this would be the case almost for all these qualities, which is that if what you mean by the porous texture, the way it feels, like when that sensation you get when you rub your fingers across, that would be secondary. But if what you mean is like the surface structure itself, like the way that the molecules are arranged that creates that texture, 
that would be a primary quality. And that's the way to really think about this. The reason why I did this in black and white is to, to highlight that color is not a second, is not a primary quality. What Locke says are real, in a way, I mean, this is me kind of updating the science a little bit, but is that essentially what exists are molecules arranged in certain ways. When these molecules are arranged in certain ways, they causally interact with our senses, and we have been wired in certain ways so that when we interact with a lemon, it causes us to have these ideas, like that it's yellow and that it's sour. But we could have been wired differently. We could have been wired such that when we bite into a lemon, it tastes sweet, like an apple. Or that instead of seeing it as yellow, it could look, that'd be the inverse on the color scale there. I don't know what that would be, but like orange or something, maybe not. Let's say orange. That, you know, you don't have, it wasn't the case that it had to be this way. But even if we, even if we all experienced the lemon in different ways, it would still have to have this structure in reality that causes all of us to have those ideas. Yeah? What would you say to somebody who's like never, who looks at like a baby, who's never seen a baby before and then looks at someone who's elderly? Because a baby is obviously like yay tall, mm -hmm. and then an elderly person's obviously a lot bigger and looks different than a child. Would you say the same? Would that be like a primary quality or? So in this case, what you're kind of raising is more a question about the general nature of human beings, right? Yeah. He would, and I think in this case he would say that that is something that we wouldn't, it would take more study to figure out. Okay. That you wouldn't be able to, on his view, connect those dots right away. That for all you know, I mean, that you would just say, well, you know, I know what they're like when they're born, I know like what they're like when they're older, but I don't know the in-between. Mm-hmm. Why is firm a secondary quality? When I mean by firm, I mean like the sensation of like when you grip it. Okay. So So would like a primary quality be like how actual hard it is? Yeah, so like we could call the primary quality like the you know, the solid that it's solid or perhaps describe it that way. Right. So when you look outside and you see the grass is green, the grass is not really green. The only sense in which we say the grass is green is what you mean is the grass has the power within it to cause me to experience greenness when I look at it. But it's not like when you stop looking when you when you stop looking at the grass, it no longer has the sensation of like bright green in it. The bright green is something that is only in your mind. It makes a little more sense actually with taste for a lot of people that the sourness of the lemon, it's not like that sensation exists in the lemon and like it like feels sour when you're not tasting it. Um, the sensation of the sourness <laughs> is only something that exists in your mind. And it just happens that this, configure, this molecular configuration of a lemon, when it touches your taste buds, causes you to have the sensation of that sour experience. But it's not like the sourness itself is inside the lemon and it's feeling sour and you're just tapping into that when you bite into it. Other questions about this. Sometimes the easiest way to make sense of what's going on is to ask, you know, these sort of like, okay, what about this? What about that? Yeah? You might have said this already, but is he going to get into like the qualities, or are we going to talk about what the qualities of the soul would be? You know, this is uh, this is something we're going to talk a little bit about in this reading. Um, just as a preview, he's going to be very he's going to be very non-committal on that. Okay. Other thoughts? Um, so one of the things he wants to say is that the ideas that are produced by secondary qualities do not really exist in material objects. So the sensation that you get, you know, the taste, the scent, the feeling, is not really, those qualities are not inside objects, those are only inside your experience. The primary qualities, though, that we get resemble attributes that really exist in material objects, like the shape, the motion, the number of things. Those qualities 
um, really do exist. So the, the age-old question, you know, if a tree falls in the forest, no one is around, does it make a sound? Locke, in a way, kind of has a way of answering that. What he would say is that if nobody is there to experience the tree falling in the forest, you have you know, the motion and the shape of the tree, all those things really exist. There are sound waves that are generated as a result of that. But is there the sensation of sound, that crashing noise, does it exist? No. You'd have to have a human observer there, and if they observed it, then those primary qualities would cause the observer to have the, the experience of the sound. Yeah? So Locke is going along with the idea that the senses are just tricking you all the time to perceive, perceive uh, primary qualities, as he puts it, in a certain sense. I don't, he would want to stay away from the word tricking. He doesn't think that it's all this like grand illusion as much as just with a little bit of thought we're able to tell that secondary qualities are only in our experience, but the primary qualities that we get through experience are real. And maybe as an interesting test case, you could ask, how could you have the idea of shape without the idea of color? But the shape is the primary quality, the color is the secondary one. Um, let's take a look at section 15 here, the way that he describes primary qualities as being real. So this is another short one here. He says, um, ideas of primary qualities are resemblances um, of, oh sorry, this is the section heading, of secondary not. All right. From which I think it is easy to draw this observation that ideas of primary qualities of body are resemblances of them, and their patterns do really exist in the bodies themselves. But the ideas produced in us by these secondary qualities have no resemblance of them at all. There is nothing like our ideas existing in the bodies themselves. They are in us, oh sorry, they are in the bodies we denominate from them only a power to produce the sensations in us. And what is sweet, blue, or warm in idea is but the certain bulk, figure, and motion of the insensible parts of the bodies themselves, which we call so. He goes on to give a couple of examples to try to help us with this as well. So the next section he talks about fire. One of the qualities, one of the ideas that fire can cause in us, get if you get too close to the fire, it can burn you and cause you pain. Do you think pain is in the fire? Do you think pain, like the fire is experiencing pain? I hope not, right? I mean, that sounds really strange. Um, if you get at a nicer distance from the fire, it gives you pleasure. If it's that like nice, warm kind of campfire feel that we like, we enjoy that. It's pleasurable. Is pleasure in the fire? Well, guess what? Are both pain and pleasure simultaneously in the fire? Locke would say, of course not. Pain and pleasure are not things that the fire itself has. Pain and pleasure are the, the ideas the fire causes us to have. But pain and pleasure don't resemble fire in any way. This also would go for this idea of like warmth. The feeling of warmth or heat is not in the fire. The, the feeling is only in our experience. What he would say is that fire does have a temperature. Like temperature is just measured by the average kinetic energy of the, the motion of the particles. So that's what, if you want to say that the fire has temperature, he's fine, but the fire doesn't have like warmth. Um, he says that that primary qualities, we, one reason we think of them as the real qualities is because they, they would exist even if, the, um, even if all the secondary qualities were stripped away. Um, so those primary qualities actually are what make us have the secondary qualities. We have, secondary, we have these ideas of secondary qualities because the primary qualities and objects cause us to have those ideas.
In section 21, it gives this really neat idea, this really neat thought experiment. This actually predates Locke, from what I understand, by maybe a millennia. But Locke gets a lot of credit for this. We're not going to read this section. I'll just explain it to you. Take two hands. Put one in cold water and one in hot water. And then in an, a third pail in front of you, there's like lukewarm water. If you take, after you soak your hands for a couple minutes in both, and you put them both in the lukewarm water, what will they feel like? What will the, the hand that was in cold, what will it feel? Warm. And one that was in the hot water? Cold, cold. Is the water in front of you simultaneously hot and cold? No. That would be contradictory. You can't have both hot and cold in the same thing. What is, what's going on there? Well, that shows that hot and cold feelings are not in objects. They aren't just in your experience. You can have sort of two separate experiences, because this is an experience with a cold hand and an experience with a hot hand. So would the fact the water is lukewarm be its primary quality, and then the secondary would be the quality that you're experiencing cold and warm? Yeah. I mean, the only thing I would, when you talk about lukewarm, all I would want to modify that as is just, once again, that's not a feeling, it's not how it feels, it's more about how the average kinetic motion of the molecules in there is measured. Because okay. it would have that average kinetic motion, even if you weren't in there feeling it. But that sensation of hot or cold you get out of it is only something that you get because you are experiencing it. And there's nothing special about the water feeling hot or cold. It's relative to you. Like, that same water could feel hot to somebody and it could feel cold to someone else. Have you ever been, like, to somebody's house that has, like, a hot tub next to a pool? And you can go, you can sit in the hot tub for a while, and then when you get up and you jump in the pool, the pool feels really cold. But somebody else who wasn't in the hot tub might think the pool feels fine. That's because the feeling you get is not in the pool, it's in your experience. Um, any questions, comments about the distinction between primary qualities and secondary qualities and how this is actually supposed to be helpful for the way that our ideas inform us about the reality outside of us? Yeah? Not exactly the, sti the distinction, but how, I don't know how to really put this, how does this not, how is like the idea of primary qualities not sort of like neo -platonism? What do you mean by that? Like, because he's saying that they exist. So what he means is, is that... Outside your mind. So the key thing there is that they resemble. Not the, the, I, the idea is that they cause us to have resemble the qualities in the things. So he doesn't want to say that the, the, the thought of rectangularness is in the book, but what the idea of rectangularness resembles a quality in the book. So all he wants to say is that the, the reality that he's talking about has, is grounded in the particular things themselves. Okay. Any other thoughts on this? You may have a test question about it, so don't leave, don't leave here without figuring this out. I'll be posting your study guide for the test. Don't forget the first hour of next class will be dedicated to the test. The next two hours, the rest of law. See you then. So just to straighten this out. All right. We are going to um, go to Locke. Um, we are about to move into free will. Let me back up just one slide where I had this kind of open question about understanding where we ended last class. The difference between primary and secondary qualities. Um, and really what I want to do is just open this up. Are there any leftover questions from last week's lesson on Locke that you have? Either about his argument against innate ideas, his positive view of empiricism and how sensation and reflection go into that, as well as his understanding of simple and complex ideas, and then finally, primary and secondary qualities. Were there any questions about that that I could address before moving forward?
Then move forward, we shall do. Um, so in the first so kind of short section of the reading here was about free will. And what Locke does in this section is he essentially says the problem of free will is, a, is a, due to a conceptual misunderstanding. And we'll see how that plays out um, in a moment. Um, he starts off in this section by saying that human powers are essentially of two kinds. That you have the power to control your thoughts and you have the power to control your bodily motions. Um, and then any other power we describe about human beings reduces essentially to one or the other. Now, in his initial description of what it means to be free in section 8, he says, so far as a man has the power to think or not to think, to move or not to move, according to the preference or direction of his own mind, so far is a man free. So this actually gives, we're going to see a couple different definitions of freedom throughout this part of the book. Locke thought he was doing something really careful and precise in this section of the essay. A lot of commentators, his time and up till now, think what Locke is doing is very confused and hard to understand, and maybe even uh, he's contradicting himself at different times. I'm going to give you my interpretation of Locke here, but different philosophers have given different understandings of what's going on in these few pages here. I think everybody has agreed that what he's doing is, is trying to first identify two different powers. And the first power that he highlights in section 8 is the power of liberty. He thinks that humans have liberty, which is the power to do or refrain from any particular action according to the determination or thought of the mind. Um, so liberty is just your ability to do one thing or do another thing. And that you have that, un it's under your own kind of control whether you do the one thing or the other. The opposite of liberty is necessity. And this is also an important point as we look at the second power. That he thinks it's really, you get a clearer idea of what the power is in terms of its opposite. So necessity is when you only have, when there's only one possibility. When you can't act in any other way. There's only one choice on the table. So liberty is when you have multiple choices. Necessity, you got one and only one. So far, so good? Now this power of liberty is to be contrasted with volition. And this is what he takes up in section 10. If you have your books, let's open it up to 350 or 351, let's see, 350. And Locke gives a very famous example in this section. So um, pay attention and notice, um, I'm going to ask you about the example, and the example of a person locked in a room. Um, and I'll just read all of section 10. It's not a very long section on page 350. He says, again, suppose a man is carried while fast asleep into a room where a person is he longs to see and speak with and is there locked fast in beyond his power to get out. He awakes and is glad to find himself in so desirable company which he stays willingly, prefers his stay to going away. I ask, is not this stay voluntary? I think nobody will doubt it. And yet, being locked fast in, it is evident that he is not at liberty not to stay. He does not have the freedom to be gone. So that liberty is not an idea belonging to volition or preferring, but to the person having the power of doing or abstaining to do, according to as the mind shall choose or direct. Our idea of liberty reaches as far as that power and no further. For wherever restraint comes to check that power or compulsion takes away that indifference of ability on either side to act or to refrain acting, their liberty and our notion of it presently ceases. So, question. 
And if we need to kind of retell the story, uh, apart from Locke's language, we can do that. But let's let me just take a stab. What do you all think about this? Does the person in the locked room, does he, does that person will voluntarily to stay there? Phil. Yes. Why do you say yes? He will voluntarily to stay because um, there's that other person in the locked room that he wanted to speak with for a long time. And so he does not want to leave that room. He wants to stay and talk to that person. Good. So it's voluntary because that's what he wants to do. Um, does the person in the locked room have the power to leave the room? Yeah, go ahead, Phil. No. And why not? Because the room is locked. Right. What Locke is, that's, the, that's what Locke wants you to take away from this example. Oops. Okay. Um, what this is supposed to show us is that an act can be voluntary, meaning that you will it, but that does not show that the act is free or at liberty. So freedom or liberty is one kind of ability we have, one kind of power we possess, but willing is another kind of power, a different power. They're not one and the same thing. Otherwise, you couldn't have a case like the one we just read where you have the ability to will something and yet not be free. Um, he gives some more examples, like in section 11, he talks about a paralyzed man who wills to lay on the ground. I guess we're supposed to suppose there's a paralyzed guy, and it's sort of like he's comfortable there. He doesn't want to move. But in this case, um, he, it's voluntary because he wills to stay down there. That's where he prefers to be. But it's also a necessary action because he lacks the power to do anything else. It's not like if he wanted to get up and walk away, he could. He's stuck there. So with liberty, the, oppos the co opposite of it was necessity. With volition or willing, the opposite of it is not necessity, but involuntary or unwilling. So, um, so when you think about voluntary actions, if somebody says it's not voluntary, don't think the act was necessary. Because you can have a voluntary act that's necessary, like the guy in the locked room, or the paralyzed man. But you cannot have a voluntary act that is also involuntary. Those would be the opposites there. <coughs> Does that make sense? Are there questions about this distinction? Because... <coughs> Locke thinks grasping this distinction is key to understanding this whole problem of free will. So when people say, like, when we say well, we have more liberty, does that mean we want a greater range of freedoms than what we might want? So usually we say these sorts of things like in a political context, right? Um, and I think that's actually right. I mean, the way Locke would have us think about it is when we want more liberties, we want the ability to do more. Not necessarily to actually do more, we just want the possibility to do such things. Other questions? So this now gives us everything we need to bring it all together. How do we bring it all together? Um, well, this is maybe the shocking part, is that Locke says the will is not, a, is not free. <gasps> He doesn't believe in free will? Strictly speaking, yes. But that's because he thinks it's unintelligible to say that the will is free. He thinks that when people ask, is the will free? That people who ask that question are asking something that is completely absurd. It's like saying, is the number five red? Or is love, um, you know, is love you know, 10 pounds. <laughs> we can frame such questions grammatically, but they don't mean anything, or they're absurd. They don't, they're not correctly formed. Locke is saying that when you ask, is the will free, you're asserting something that is absurd and ill-formed. That's because he believes that liberty is not something that belongs to the will. Freedom is not something that belongs to the will. It belongs to a person. You don't ask whether wills are free or not. You ask whether persons are free or not. Um, 
So the will is an attribute of an agent because the will is one of its powers. And likewise, liberty is one of the agent's powers. But, so when you ask, is the will free, what you're asking is whether one power, willing, has another power, being free. And he thinks that's crazy. That's like asking, can your perception have perceptions? Can your beliefs have beliefs? Or even better, can your perception have beliefs? Like, that would be weird to say any, to ask any of those questions, right? You, you don't say that your perception has beliefs, or that your beliefs have perceptions. You say, I have beliefs, and I have perceptions. Those are two separate things I possess. They don't belong to one another. Likewise, I have the ability to will, and I have the ability to act freely, but, I don't, but my will doesn't have the ability to act freely. So it makes no sense whether your will, that is the power to choose, has liberty, which is the power to do or refrain from acting. And on his analysis, this is why the whole problem of free will has exists. The whole problem of free will is really due to a, a mistake in the way we think about it. If we apply sort of a careful way to think about willing and freedom, it dissolves the problem. <coughs> so the question, is the will free, that's unintelligible. Like I said, that's like saying, is, you know, what kind of cat is God? Um, it just doesn't make sense. That's an improper question. The right question, though, the one that really should concern us is, is a person free? Or when is a person free? That, he says, is, is asking the right sort of thing. And he answers this in section 21. He says, a person is free when he is at liberty to do what he wills. And he says in section 21, for how can we think anyone freer than to have the power to do what he will? Like, what more do you want? Thus, a free person is one who has liberty, the power to act or refrain from acting, to do what he wills to do. Now, on my analysis, that means the person in the, who is in that room with the, with the door locked is not free. <coughs> he can will, he has volition, but he's not able to do anything otherwise. He doesn't have liberty in Locke's sense. You can't act in any other way. So the person in the locked room is not an illustration of a, of a free person. It's an illustration of just a person who is exercising their, their will. Here's the way I want to, the way I think about this issue for law. Um, you can think about it when you combine, so in the top division is the difference between liberty and necessity. When an agent has liberty, that agent has the ability to act or refrain from acting. Um, so in the, this would be somebody who's in the room and the room is not locked. They are able to stay in the room and they're able to leave the room. On the right-hand side, I have it where the agent lacks liberty. So this would be a case where the agent is in a locked room. There's no other choice they could make. Now, let's start on the, the right-hand side where it's necessitated. When the act is necessitated, you're not free. So you can have a, a case where it is necessitated and not voluntary. Um, sorry, where it is necessitated and it's not voluntary. That would be like somebody who's thrown in jail. Somebody, at least most people who are thrown in jail, do not want to be in jail. That makes it not voluntary. If They would rather do something else than sit in a jail cell. But the person who's in jail also is there by necessity, which means even if they wanted to, even if it were the case they wanted uh, to, to leave, they couldn't leave. Like, the, the bars necessitate that they have to sit there in the jail cell. There's no other possibility for them. 
The next one here, it would be like somebody who's in that locked room that Locke describes, where somebody is there voluntarily, like that's what they want to do, that's what they will to do, but there's no other possibility for them. They can't will to do anything. Uh, even if they will to do something else, they have to stay in that locked room. And for that reason, I would say the person is not free. Now, in the next two cases, we have it where they have liberty, where they can do one thing or the other thing. They're not stuck doing exactly one thing. In that, so in this case, this is kind of a weird one where the act is not voluntary, but you could do something other than what you actually do. Does anybody, can anybody think of a case that would be like that? Where you can choose, where you have the ability to do one thing or the other, but your choice is not voluntary. Will? Say like maybe homeless people purposely committing a crime to be in prison during winter months and they just voluntarily done something differently that they chose to do that way and then our actions are restricted based on their initial choice. Why do you think that it's not a voluntary act in that case? Because you've got to freeze the death Given really voluntary, like you know, what choice do you have? So, given that the, the that the only alternative is like freezing to death, you know, maybe you could say that that it really wasn't a voluntary thing. Maybe they don't want. You could argue that maybe these are like they noble. They don't want to do it, but yeah. it's the best possible solution to their problem. Yeah, that might be the kind of thing he has in mind. Um, anyone have any other thoughts? I think that might work. Yes, yeah, sir. Like coming to class, like we chose to take this class, and then like coming to class, like we can get like kind of taken off. So like, like kind of not voluntary. Is that what you think about this? Class? <laughs> <laughs> Just like any class yeah. that has like a restriction on like um, attendance. Yeah, that might be the the kind of case he has in mind as well, where there are very strict rules or consequences, and that makes it a lot like Will's case, where those consequences are so harsh that there's a sense in which you don't really want to do that, but you could do otherwise. I was thinking also of a case, maybe, I mean, this is even a weirder case, but like, where you might have a seizure, and suppose that you have a seizure, but the kind of event, it's like a quantum event, where the seizure could cause you to act in one of two different ways. So maybe in one version of the seizure that you could do, it would be like you throwing up. Lovely thought, I know. And the other one is just where you like flop on the floor for a while, and um, you know, or that's the form your seizure takes. You could do, let's say, one or the other. Like physically, the quant, you know, the, the quantum indeterminacy in your body makes it such that either event could take place. But whether you do the one or the other is not under your control. You don't will one or the other. Just one or the other is going to take place, and. Um, it takes place against your will. But maybe, like what, I think some, this is what the examples that y'all are bringing are the ones most of my students do, and I think that might actually be a more easier to grasp kind of example. And then finally, the far left-hand side, I think that's the only true case where Locke would say you are all thoroughly free. So when you have liberty, you're able to do one thing or the other thing, and it is also voluntary, so that when uh, you will to do that action. <coughs> and this would be like a case where, um, you know, most of the cases where we do think we're free. So that if you choose to, you know, get pizza at lunch, um, you, it's what you want to do, and you could have gotten, you know, hamburgers or a salad or whatever else instead. Um, so it is free when you have both liberty and voluntariness for the action. Any questions about Locke on free will? This would be, if you had any questions about any passage on 350 to 352, um, this is your place to ask. Or if there's anything I can try to clarify this, if you have any what if questions for Locke on free will.
Yeah, Alex. So, like, where would, like, slavery be in this? Presumably, the sla slaves are both, they both follow necessity and involuntariness. We can get, I mean, you, we could argue, some people might say some of the slaves maybe, maybe had a choice. Like, you, maybe they, so think of, like, a case where a slave owner doesn't really enforce, like, their slavery. It's just sort of like a psychological thing. So the slaves really wanted to get up and leave, they could. But maybe they're, like, so psychologically conditioned, they don't think to do that. You might get into some weird cases like that. But for the most part, I think that we say they can't act otherwise because they've either got chains around them or there's, like, the threat of death if they try to leave. So it, all, it makes it so there's no real other possibility. And furthermore, we typically think slaves aren't, don't do so voluntarily, that they would rather do something else with their life than that. Okay. Um, about the person that's in the locked room. Yeah. Could you just imagine the planet Earth, I guess, as a bigger version of a locked room on a different scale? Like you still have liberty in the locked room to do what we want. Right. And so very few people, like, you know, Alan Shepard, you know, and Buzz Aldrin, Neil Armstrong, they get to, they're the only ones who've had, like, the freedom to leave this terrestrial ball. And Locke would say you're, that with regard to the choice of whether to be on Earth or not on Earth, most of us don't have the liberty to, at, with regards to that. Like, 99.9999999999% of human beings, actually need more nines than that, have no liberty with respect to the choice of being on Earth or not. So liberty in that case would be relative to the choices you have to make or, or the act of being on Earth or not being on Earth. So whenever you ask, do you have liberty with Locke or really with any philosopher, you ask the way you flesh out, you say with respect to what? With respect to whether I'm a human being or not? I don't think I have choice over that. What's that? Well, like, I feel like well, there's no way you'd be free from laws of physics. Mm -hmm. So is that... And that would be another one. We had, we're not at liberty to, you know, change the laws of physics. Not at liberty to change the past. We're not at liberty right now to uh, get, you know, Gwyneth Paltrow <coughs> and, uh, oh, what's his name, Chris Martin, back together again. Um, they can't make it. I don't know if we can. Um, <laughs> So, those would be the sorts of things, like, we had, I think everybody would say, we just have no control over those things, so we're not at liberty with them. But you do have some say in things like, you know, what clothes you wear, what, you know, what you choose to eat for lunch, whether, um, you know, whether you're going to do the homework or not, those kinds of things. So are you really afraid? Why would you say not? Say I wanted to fly. I can't. That's true. I don't know. So freedom doesn't, shouldn't apply to just literally anything. We're not God, right? We don't have the ability to just do whatever we want. So with certain things, we're not absolutely free. And usually the way philosophers think about this is not whether we have absolute freedom, because we certainly don't, but whether we have any freedom at all. And that's been usually the issue, because the people who are on the other side of this argument, the determinists, say not that most everything is determined and you might be free with a few things, they say you're free with respect to nothing. So to refute the alternative, all you have to show is that there's some subclass of choices that we have that we are free. And so often students find it a little depressing when we study these things, they find out that free will probably is much more limited in scope than we thought. We actually spend a lot more time on this topic in my intro class, for those of you that were in that. And if you like this topic, there's a lot of things I could recommend for you to read that would be in line with uh, this topic for your paper. Any other thoughts on free will? Yeah, Phil? So before you were saying that uh, we can be free in one respect, but not another. Like we could not be free by being in the locked room, but we could be free in choosing a turkey sandwich rather than a ham sandwich. Mm -hmm. 
In Locke's sense, it's just a matter of thinking through these categories and saying, is the act at liberty or necessity? And is, the, is, it an act, is the act voluntary or involuntary? And as we work through that, work through those questions, that tells you where you land on the grid. Mm -hmm. I think we've used this example before, but uh, with the drowning child. Yeah. Like you have the choice, to, but you're most likely going to save the child. So, <coughs> lot, this is where a lot of philosophers, where Locke doesn't have much to say on the extent of like how free you have to be psychologically. So, like, you see the child drowning in the mud on your way to school. Hopefully, you don't have it within you to just turn the other way and just keep going, right? I mean, hopefully, you are constituted such that if you see another human being that will inevitably die without you, you know, just giving a little bit of your time, you're going to stop and help. And hopefully, you do so almost like it's compelled by your nature, so you couldn't do anything differently. But... <laughs> Once you go that route, then you have to say, well, was it really a free action if you're compelled by your nature to do it? Locke doesn't have much to say about that. And you might wonder, this is where in the, so the top category isn't always clear. So by the top category in that scenario, would you be at liberty to save the child? Or would that be more like it's voluntary but necessitated? And if it falls under that category, that almost seems to violate the way that we think about, you know, we tend to think that would be a free action. So how important is the first distinction for freedom? It's these kinds of problems that have made the philosophical topic of free will, you know, worthy of a class in its own right. <laughs> yeah? In the case of the child... Uh, drowning, as bad as it sounds, wouldn't we be at liberty to not save them? Why would you say that? Well, some people, I mean, I guess some people could be so, like you said, psychologically, if they're, maybe if they're, if they have some kind of, like, condition where that might be, I don't know how to describe it really, but we do have the ability, we don't, there isn't any other there is other things that we could do. Mm -hmm. We could just continue. We could choose to ignore it. Although most people wouldn't, because we would want to see a person live. Yeah. We still have the ability to ignore it if we really wanted to. So as long, I mean, that, in a way, this is the other thing: is to settle these questions. Maybe we can't settle them as philosophers. Maybe we have to bring in a psychologist or you know a neuroscientist or somebody in to help us figure out what do we really have control over. Um, so maybe we really do have as m we have control over those kinds of cases. Maybe we're strongly compelled to help, but not necessitated. Like we really could, you might say, I really could walk past that child. I won't choose to do it, but I could do it. Yeah. yeah I was going to get uh, along his lines, because like sociopaths mm -hmm. um, have That's less okay. blood flowing to certain parts of their brain. Right. So they're more, they have more liberty, but they're, they're thinking less <laughs> about it. And, Which is odd. and then you have to wonder, is that what we, if that's what it takes, suppose that we're in the child drowning case, it really is necessary, and though it would be like this, do we really want that to be a free act then? <laughs> it's almost like you would rather it not be free, but voluntary. And some people read Locke this way, that really what they think Locke really wants is not liberty, but just voluntariness, that if it's something that you want to do, that's really all it takes to get praise or blame. Any final thoughts on the free will issue before we move on to substance? I, think I, I feel like that example is like, it's a good one because I, I wouldn't know where to put, like obviously we, it would be voluntary to do that. But I wouldn't know where to put it if it has liberty or, or if it's necessitated. And that's the other thing is that whether something is at liberty, just like the guy in the locked room, you don't know these things just by reflecting on your state of mind. The guy in the locked room, if you were to, he doesn't know the door's locked. How would he be able to, so he doesn't, he's not in a position to tell if he is at liberty or not. So if I'm right, if this is the right way to think about lock on free will, whether an act is truly free in that far category is something we wouldn't be able to determine just by reflecting on our choices. You'd have to have 
some outside study to kind of assure you that you really could have done otherwise. Mm -hmm. I have a question. I don't know if this applies or not. I've been like throwing it back and forth in my head. But I was in Mass once and the priest was asking a question and he's basically stated, like as an example, the guy who works a drawbridge lifts it up and down. There's a guy, mechanic working on the gears, but there's a boat coming. Mm -hmm. So if he, it's his job to lift the bridge up. If he lifts the bridge up, he saves the people on the boat, but the guy in the gears dies. Right. But if he doesn't, the guy working on the gears lives, but everyone on the boat's going to die. How would that fall into play with this? So this would be, this would be, I think, a paradigm example of, of, of a free choice. Because you can come up with good reasons to do one thing or the other thing. Usually, the cases that are most clearly identifiable as free choices are ones where you can come up with good reasons to do one or the other. I think we, we worry where cases where it's clear cut, you got to do the one thing, that psychologically you're compelled. What that case actually raises in a lot of ways is more about the question of um, our role in bringing about harm to others. Some people are inclined in that case to think, because if you're operating the drawbridge, if you push the button and you kill the guy at the gears, that's, you, it, that's the worst thing you can do because you have like, played a role in bringing about his death. Your agency brought that about. But if you do nothing, if like, you just kind of stand back and you just let nature take its course and the people on the boat die, even though more of them die, some people say that's better because you didn't play an active role in killing them. And so this raises sort of an issue more about value, which is about human rights. Do, human, do humans have a, which is stronger, their right to not be harmed, so that'd be the right of the guy working on the gears, or the right to prevent people from being harmed, which would be the people on the boat. And in some versions of the story, uh, a lot of people think that the guy working on the gears, his rights trump the people on the boat. And other people, their intuitions go the other way around. It's kind of a cool example. I'm, I'm glad you, you heard that before, because like, I, I didn't know, I remember hearing that when I was like 10 years old, and I didn't know if it applied to this or not, and I was like, I didn't want to ask, but <laughs> I figured I'd ask anyway. Mm -hmm. What about in like the case of someone who is like mentally impaired and like does like a crime like kills someone? Would that be like a free action? <laughs> if the if the mental impairment necessitates their action, then it would fall on this side of the graph. Now the question would be if they do it voluntarily or not. So suppose they do it voluntarily. This then raises the issue of whether. For moral assessment, for moral praise and blame, does it really? Do you really need to have liberty, or can we just pass moral praise and blame just on the voluntariness well, of the why act? Why would you say they wouldn't? They would. They would have liberty because they they have more liberty because they're open more to do more things. It depends on the mental impairment. The way I imagine it was almost like there's a an issue that determines. It's like the mental impairment caused them to like do the action. All right. I was thinking more the mental impairment allowed them to yeah. take the action. So they were more like a sociopath where they could almost do one thing or the other a little more easily. Yeah, some people have like a, a like a, some people have tumors that right. cause them to, to do an action like that, so that would be necessitated probably. If you had it on that version, it would be necessitated. Right. On maybe the way you're trying, maybe that would open up the possibility for it being free as well. Sociopaths can, <coughs> sociopaths can function just like any other yeah. human. They just are much more open. If you want to take a real strong view on free will, there's a philosopher named Immanuel Kant. Hey, we're going to read him at the end of the semester. Um, he thinks that you're only really free for things that you don't want to do. Like you have no motive to do them. So, like, if you're going to go on a date with somebody and let's say they want to watch like a terrible movie like The Notebook. Um, you are only free, like you only exercise freedom with that choice if you don't want to watch that movie. You have no motive to do so. And there's a sense in which some people really get this. You're like, yeah, like that, the fact that you made the choice to watch this terrible movie shows that you exercise free will. There's no, re you had no reason to watch it. Now, 
if you watch the movie because that's like your favorite movie, you didn't do it by you didn't do it freely. You had a motive. You had a reason to do it. Now, if you put it this way, though, um, on Kant's view, get, you're free with very with respect to very few choices. It's hard to, in fact, some would argue you're free with regard to no choices because some would say it's incoherent for you to make a choice without a motive for picking it. If you're interested in these things, um, you know, look, I'm, I'm considering doing a whole course on free will sometime in the near future, so you can always look for that. Or you can major in philosophy and think about these things all the time. <laughs> Um, other interesting examples or problems with free will? Or specific passages from Locke in here that I that you, you need clarified or explained that I've not gone over? Yeah? Could we maybe pr get a, an example of... I know we kind of did one for having liberty, yeah. but not voluntary. Yeah. Maybe in the strictest case, here would be an, maybe another one. These are always hard to come up with, but you get robbed, like at gunpoint. They say, your money or your life. There's maybe, you maybe are at liberty to give him your wallet or to run or attack him, but given the fact there's like a gun in your face, if you hand over your wallet, you're not really doing it willingly. You're doing it sort of you know, um, against your will. That might be, so that might be a case where you are at liberty to do one thing or the other, but the action you choose to do is against your will. But wouldn't you be voluntarily giving him your wallet? Instead yeah. Instead of giving him your, that, that, I, I, I hate to be that. I think this is where it gets complicated because you might say all things considered, since you don't want to lose your life, you actually willingly choose to hand it over. There's a, there is a sense in which you can say, yeah, the act was done willingly. Like I get, I get the sense of, I get the sense of liberty in that in that situation where you could, you could, like you said, run away, attack, or, you know, or give the wallet up. But then it's kind of confusing that you give him your wallet instead of running away or attacking, mm -hmm. and it's not voluntary that you do that because I feel like it would be voluntary to give the wallet instead of like running or attacking. I think maybe the other way to do this is kind of like I was the weirder case I originally gave, which is like there's a <laughs> quantum event in your brain where one thing or the other thing could happen. Like it's not determined. So you could have a seizure where you throw up, or you could have a seizure where you flop on the ground. Um, but which one takes place is not according to your will. You know, one, whatever happens, either one could take place, but the one that takes place doesn't follow your choice. So it's just sort of like a random event that happens to you. Do you have the, in that case, do you have the liberty to have or not have the seizure? No. <laughs> so whether you have a seizure or not is ne is necessitated. Whether it's this kind of seizure or that kind okay. of seizure. Okay. Or if I, maybe make the quantum event such that you either have the seizure or you don't have it. But still, you have no control. You don't will to have it or not have it. Or right. you certainly don't will to have it. Okay. <laughs> yeah? Um, well, I don't know if this makes sense, but like, for being pregnant, like, people have the ability to either, you know, have sex or refrain from it, but then the act of the growing of these is not voluntary. So, with regard to like, conception, not like, getting yeah. pregnant. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> so we have choice, we have the, at least the ability to choose whether we, we engage in sex or not, at least, in, at least consensual sex, and then we, but we have no control over conception. <laughs> Alex. I was just going to say, for the, the quantum event, wouldn't you not really have the liberty? Because whatever is going to happen is, isn't really within your range of choice. It's just a possible event. So, so it's not under your control whether the one event or the other takes place. Yeah. 
That might be right, so then I might still have another problem here. I would say at least on one way to understand his notion of liberty, that either it happens or it doesn't happen, either one is possible. But maybe, I mean, the way actually he defines liberty, maybe you're right, because he talks about it sort of being under your, sort of according to your mind, according to your choice. So maybe, maybe I have to think of a better example. Which may mean I have to come back to these ones like getting robbed or having, you know, somebody like compel you to do something. But um, I think this category is the hardest one to understand. Yeah? choices for eating are limited. There are only so many things, like, you know, you walk in the cafeteria and you're a married woman. Mm -hmm. limited to the choices that the cafeteria has made for you. You can choose to go in there or not, but once you go in there, you're limited. So you might be... <laughs> so, e <laughs> this is eating in... Whether you eat in the cafeteria or not is at liberty. Once you go in there and you're like, oh, crap, all they have is this. Yeah. I don't want to eat this, but I already paid, so... Um. <laughs> I mean, but you... <laughs> I guess you could walk out and not eat anything, even though you already paid. It's not like you're... You have to eat the food. But I think that's just the way to cash. <laughs> what if it... Maybe the, the case would be something like this, where you... You're put into a jail cell. You think it's locked but it's actually not locked. Like, you hear it clang shut, but you never go check. And so you sit in that jail cell the whole time saying, I wish I could get out of here. That would be an act that is not voluntary, because you would not choose to do that, but it actually turned out to be at liberty, you just never checked the door. <laughs> so it was a trick. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, that's maybe enough free will for today. Let's uh, <laughs> let's take about a, about a ten minute break. So when the clock says uh, seven thirty five, we'll pick up again. Let's go ahead and get back into law. <laughs> um, any final thoughts on on at least? Is, I just want to make sure we're clear on what Locke is up to here. Um, distinguishing willing from liberty, and that this is supposed to help us conceptually figure out the problem of free will. Hmm. What about our food example, boys? <laughs> what did you come up with? I I still can't I still can't come up with anything for that. The act is not voluntary under liberty. Yeah. I feel hey. like if it has liberty, then you are voluntarily choosing it. So what do you think of the case I was saying where you think you're in a locked room? but it's not actually locked. So you sort of stay there and you're grumpy, but you just never go and like check to see if it's unlocked. But you have the liberty to see if it's unlocked, right? Yeah, you do, but... But you just... You just never... You, you never... The issue is whether you want to stay in the room or leave. You want to leave, you just never went up and like checked to see if it was locked. You assumed it was locked when it wasn't. I hate to make this so complicated, <laughs> but like, don't you voluntarily choose not to get up and check that it's not locked? Yes. <laughs> oh, man, this is killing me. Probably a blatant example because it doesn't have to do with people. But um, I'm thinking about, like, because I like a, like, like a video game program I made. Like, the, the, the program has multiple options to do something. But, so it has the liberty to choose all those options. But whatever option it actually has, that's not a voluntary choice because it's all determined by the program. So that would be, that seems to me like it would fall on this right hand side, right? But it has the liberty to do the all this stuff. Why did it ha so how do you have the liberty to do the other? Depending on what the situation is, it could do any of those. But the program decides which one it is, yeah. not you. So this would then get into the same kind of issue that I, that I think you were raising with the quantum example that I was bringing up, which is, well, but it's still not up to your decision. Okay. Anyway, <laughs> if you're really interested in this, <laughs> write a paper on it. <laughs> the next topic is a very different one, and this was, this is probably, maybe you think this about everything you read in this class, but this is one of the more abstract parts of what Locke is up to. 
Probably. And it has to do with how do we get the idea of substance? Did we do substance in intro? Oh, in bit. your section we talked some about substances, yes. Okay. With regards to that brain article about splitting your brain in half. Yeah, okay. And a few uh, of you who may have been in philosophy of religion also got exposed to this idea of what happens when you split your brain. Um, don't worry about that right now. Um, this whole issue is really important for Locke, for one, because he believes there are substances. Think back to Descartes. We talked about substance with Descartes with the wax argument, and as well, we talked about substance as well in, in our discussion of Meditation 6. Um, the other thing is, why is this hard for Locke? Is because he's an empiricist. And as an empiricist, he thinks all of our ideas come from experience. But you don't, as we're going to get into a little bit later tonight, you don't experience what a substance is. You, at best, experience the qualities of a substance, but you don't experience the substance itself. Before we get, don't worry if that's over your head for the moment. Let's turn to page 359, and let's just get started on this, and we'll see how this hopefully all comes together. Um, I'm going to read section one from book two, chapter 23. Um, and what I want us to think about as we read through this section is what reasons do, does Locke give for us to believe that substance or substratum exists? He says, the mind being, as I have declared, furnished with a great number of the simple ideas conveyed in by the senses as they are found in exterior things or by reflection on its own operations, takes notice also that a certain number of these simple ideas go con constantly together, which, being presumed to belong to one thing, and words being suited to common apprehensions, and made use of for quick dispatch are called so united in one subject by one name. This inadvertence we are apt afterwards to talk of and consider as one simple idea, which indeed is a complication of many ideas together. Because, as I have said, not imagining how these simple ideas can subsist by themselves, we accustom ourselves to suppose some substratum, to which they do subsist, and from which they do result, which therefore we call substance. So why do we believe in substance? What are some of the... He, there's at least kind of two trains of thought I see in here. Um, they might actually ultimately maybe be one and the same thing, but what are some of the considerations that he gives for why we should believe that there are substances or substrata? Yeah, well. Is it because we believe and perceive all of these simple ideas and how they work together, mm -hmm. um, which would create substance? So then that forms our belief in substance? Yeah, I, I think this is like the real key thing is that think of all the ideas you have when we think of something like this water bottle. This water bottle is accompanied by, is just. The way you think about it is a number of ideas. It's shape, it's kind of color, um, the way it, you know, if you can't even taste it, the way it tastes, the way it smells. Those are all ideas that are united together in this one object. Well, Locke says, what, what holds all of these ideas together in one thing? Where do you get all those qualities? How come they all seem to hang out in this thing? And I can throw it around, and the ideas stay united together. Well, there's got to be something that holds all those ideas, that possesses the ideas. So if it weren't for substances, how would you explain how all these different qualities that we think things have stay together? So we need to suppose, you'll notice he says we don't see or we don't experience, but we have to infer we have to put forward that there is some kind of thing that holds all these different ideas together, that unites the ideas into one object. So that this, all the ideas that we, or, or the qualities that we associate with this bottle, 
stay kind of tied together by one thing that has them. And Locke is saying here it seems to be the only way that we can unite all of these simple ideas together into one thing in one particular place and time. So substance is not something you experience or perceive, but it's something you have to postulate or infer in order to make sense of all, all those simple ideas that we think are united into one subject. Now, so this then raises the question, what is this idea of substance? Um, and we're going to see, he's going to tell us that we don't really have a particular, specific idea of substance. There is, when it comes to thinking about substance, it's a very vague and unspecified idea. A general notion of this kind of postulated entity. Once again, I'm going to read part of section two here, starting at the beginning and then I'm going to skip down. Um, so this is section two on 359. He says, Thus, if anyone will examine himself concerning his notion of pure substance in general, he will find he has no other idea of it at all, but only a supposition of he knows not what support of such qualities, which are capable of producing simple ideas in us. Skip down the bottom, like, five lines of that on that page. He says, and thus... Here, as in all other cases where we use words without having clear and distinct ideas, we talk like children who, being questioned what such a thing is, which they do not know, readily give this satisfactory answer, that it is something. In truth, this signifies no more when so used either by children or men, but that they know not what and that the thing they pretend to know and talk of is what they have no distinct idea of at all, and so are perfectly ignorant of it and in the dark. The idea, then, we have, to which we give the general name substance, being nothing but the supposed but unknown support of those qualities we find existing, which we imagine cannot subsist, sine re substante, without a substance, Without something to support them, we call that support substantia, which according to the true import of the word is in plain English, standing under or upholding. So, Locke is saying we need to come up with something that has, that holds, that stands under those qualities that, that are in objects. Once again, otherwise, what would, how do you get all these qualities united into one thing? How can they don't fly apart? How can they stay together when, you know, over time? There needs to be some substance that holds qualities. Now, you need to also remember that substance itself cannot be another quality. If substance were another quality, like if substance itself was just extension or solidity or something like that, this would lead to an infinite regress. Because then you'd have to say, what holds the extension or the solidity? Another substance. And if that is just another extension, you say, well, then what holds that? And so on. You need to have something that's not a quality to end the regress. Oh, because if you say all qualities require a substance, then whatever... Uh, then you can't define substance as being another quality. So, ultimately, what is a substance? He says it's something we're not sure of. It's th that part I, the second part I read, where he's saying, you know, it's like when kids don't know what they've just experienced. You say, hey, what, you know, what caused that? And they say, a something. Well, that's not really informative. Well, in a way... <laughs> That's all Locke can say of what a substance is. You ask Locke, what is a substance? He's going to say it's a thing. Well, tell me more about it. I, I can't. I don't know any more about it. All I know is there's got to be some substance, some thing that has qualities, because if there weren't a thing that had qualities, then you wouldn't be able to explain how ideas and, and qualities stay united together in one thing. Yeah? On the third bullet, why exactly is having an infinite regress a bad thing? 
Well, because in this case, there's a dependence relation. We think the qualities depend on the substance to continue to exist, to, to sort of have their being. So if you say that, well, if it just goes on infinitely, you never get to the bottom of, of this chain of dependence. Sort of be like if I had a paper clip that was suspended by another paper clip. It's one thing if I can say there's something that's not a paper clip, like my hand holding it up, but if I just say it just is paper clips infinitely, that doesn't explain how this thing is hanging here. So if substance is supposed to be the reason that explains why the qualities exist, it can't just be qualities all the way down. Okay. <laughs> um, I want to come back to this issue, which is that this is a problem for empiricists like Locke. And when we get to the reading by Berkeley in a couple of weeks, um, which um, group number four should be preparing for, that um, this idea is hard for empiricists to accommodate because you don't experience substances. On Locke's view, what you experience are qualities. Like you experience the color, the shape, the, you know, the solidity, the sound, the taste, the but you don't experience the substance as it is in itself. This is, once again, kind of like Descartes' point with the wax. With the wax, do you perceive wax <laughs> itself? Remember all the way back to that, Descartes says, no. You perceive those surface features or qualities of the wax. And that's why when the wax goes from being on the cold side of the room to the hot side, when you take it near the fire, all those qualities change. It's still the same substance or thing. But whatever that substance or thing is better not be what you were perceiving because everything you've perceived is different, but the substance is the same. So what Locke is trying to do is tell us that a substance is a special kind of idea we have. It's a complex idea. Um, <clears throat> so, but it's an idea we don't experience directly. What experience provides us with are these ideas ab about objects, about their qualities, not about the things themselves. But we can't experience what that object is in itself, according to law. So we're looking at the apple here. You can see the redness of the apple, but the apple itself is not the redness. The redness is just a quality or a feature of the apple. You can see the roundness of the apple. But the roundness is not the substance of the apple. The roundness is once again just a quality or a feature that is that the apple possesses. The apple itself as a substance is something besides its redness, sweetness, roundness, firmness. Um, it's something that once again you can't perceive. But you have to believe there is a substance, Locke says, that has those qualities, otherwise what would explain how the roundness, the sweetness, the redness, and the firmness all remain united in that one thing. There needs to be some thing that has the qualities. It doesn't make sense to just say the apple is just a bunch of qualities tied together with, to nothing. Um, so, for Locke, and a substance is something that we really don't have a clear idea about what it is. It's something you have to infer exists because that's the only way to make sense of our experience of the world. But positively, what idea do we have of substance? It's just whatever it is, this I know not what, that holds the qualities together. Locke wants us to since we don't have a direct experience of substance, substance is a complex idea. If you remember, simple ideas are those ideas that you get through experience, like just a basic color concept, like the concept of red. Red is a simple idea. Substance is not a simple idea. It's The way I put it with the apple is the apple is that thing, whatever it is, that is the cause of my ideas of sweetness, roundness, firmness, redness. The way that this is a complex idea, it's, just, it's this combination of ideas, of the cause, 
of the holding of, of these qualities. <laughs> we don't, as, I was, as I've said a few times, we do not have a simple idea of substance because we have no direct experience of substances. What do you have direct experience of? The qualities. But the qualities are di distinct from the substance itself. Um, in the passage we read, and in other places, he emphasized that substance is what stands under the qualities. It's the thing that holds the qualities. It's the thing that gives the quality, the, the, those qualities, their reality. And the relationship between qualities and substance is a dependent one. That the qualities, ex the, the existence of those qualities is dependent upon the existence of their substances. So the qualities exist because the substances exist, but not vice versa. Questions about substance so far? And um, this might, and I could even say, any questions about anything up to section about 14 here? Yeah. I don't know if we went over this or not, at, um, if we touched on it, but did he, did Locke believe that these substances had extension or... Mate Good. This is the next point then, is talking about material and immaterial substances. So, there are different kinds of substances. There are bodily substances, which are things that are extended, figure, and figured, and capable of motion. So in Descartes' metaphysics, material substances. And then there are spiritual or mental substances. And these are things that are capable of thinking. He has a lot to say about this in sections 18 to 20 of the reading. Now here's the kicker for Locke. We, we have a very unclear idea of spiritual substance, whatever that might be the substance that thinks. But Locke says our idea of what bodily substance is just as unclear. Because we, when we're trying to even understand what is the, the, the apple, what is the substance of the apple, even that we have to just say it's this I know not what that holds all these qualities. And if you, some people have argued against the existence of a soul on the basis of it, it's hard to imagine what an immaterial substance is. And Locke's response that he gives to this several times in our reading is that, well, if you think that's an argument against the soul, that's an argument against material things, too, because we have a very hard time even understanding what a material substance is. Now, Locke was the one that said, uh, is, it, is the reason that he's leaving this so vague, I guess, like that there's not a clear explanation, is because wasn't he the one that said, we have like limits to our knowledge and some things we just don't need to or we'll, we'll never be able to answer so we should just leave them for what they are. That's right. So he's got in some ways a kind of humble view of the limits of human reason. So he's going to say we just may not be able, I mean in principle it's just beyond human capacities to know what substance is. And as a result of being kind of admitting there's this lack of clarity and distinctness about our understanding of spiritual and bodily substances, he's agnostic about the mind-body relation. So, <coughs> if you were to ask Locke, are mind and body two separate substances, he would say, I don't know. They might be, they might not be. But he's quite open to the possibility that matter could think. Whereas Descartes did not think that was even possible. And I, I would say Leibniz as well, that they would both say that the that matter doesn't have the capacity to think. Like that's just incoherent to think matter is a thinking thing. But for Descartes, or for Locke, he says, I can imagine matter having thought in it. Um, this kind of goes back to that part from last week where Locke was saying, I, I don't think the mind always thinks. I think it's possible to go in for when you sleep, for instance, to have no thoughts at all. If Descartes thinks that the essence of the mind is to think, then in order for the mind to exist, it has to always be thinking. 
if it stops thinking, it stops existing. Locke is going to say, whatever the mind is, it could be a separate substance, like an immaterial soul, or it could just be a part of the body, it could be part of your brain. That that's just one power that the, the spirit has. That it's just one power, and that the mind may be, have other powers with it as well. Did Locke ever touch on this, the uh, Leibniz subject of the monad? Like, did he, what did he think about that? I don't know offhand. Um, I know, so I do know Leibniz had a lot to say about Locke. I don't know if Locke had a lot to say about Leibniz. Okay. Um, in this section is where he does bring up how we come to know what kind of thing God is. Why? It kind of feels weird, like, right? where did this come from? We're talking about substances, and all of a sudden, God. That's partly because God is a certain kind of spiritual substance. Um, that on the traditional view, um, traditional Western monotheistic view, God is um, an immaterial substance. So let's take a look at how he does this on section, in section 33 um, and see how does he come up with the idea of God. And once again, think of his empiricism. Given his empiricism, that you only have ideas about things you experience, and he does believe in God. He wrote a book called The Reasonableness of Christianity. How can you as an empiricist explain how we get the idea of God? Uh, let's take a look at this. It says, For if we examine the idea we have of the incomprehensible supreme being, we shall find that we come by it the same way, and that the complex ideas we have both of God and separate spirits are made of the simple ideas we receive from reflection. Having from what we experience in ourselves gotten the ideas of existence and duration, of knowledge and power, of pleasure and happiness, and of several other qualities and powers, which it is better to have than to be without. When we would frame an idea of the most suitable we can to the Supreme Being, we enlarge every one of these with our idea of infinity, and so putting them together make our complex idea of God. For that the mind has such a power of enlarging some of its ideas received from sensation and reflection has already been shown. So, as an empiricist, how do we come up with the idea of God? Yeah, Zach and Will's on deck. Um, is it taking all of the experiences of happiness, pleasure, and uh, all the kind of the simple experiences that we take and kind of combine that into a complex idea of what we think God would be like? I think that's that's pretty good. Well, exactly where I was going with it. We created through experience. We've experienced all these great powers that we would attribute to a, a you know, the perfect being, like the, the perfect person or something, like that would be the best way to do it. Um, and through that we have derived the idea of a all-powerful being because of all the simple ideas combined into the complex. Good. So we have the idea of like what it is to be better than, and then we have the ideas of like power, knowledge, pleasure, happiness. And we just say whatever is better to have, God has those qualities than not. So whatever is better to have than not to have, God would possess. And then of those qualities that we think that they have, we just say, and then God has them to the highest limits we can imagine, to infinity. To infinity and beyond. <laughs> Quote, plus light here. So, um, it's interesting, so you can imagine, <coughs> Locke is saying that this is consistent with believing in God, um, but you can imagine somebody who doesn't believe in God saying, yeah, that's how we invented the idea of God. And in fact, a lot of people in Locke's time thought that this was a threat to believing in God. Um, one, of the, one of his opponents, a bishop Stillingfleet, actually argued that because of that Locke's rejection of innate ideas and that Locke's um, explanation, especially of how we get the idea of God, 
is one main reason for people that people are atheists. Um, so he thinks that Locke's whole project runs contrary to um, what devout, good Christians should believe. Obviously, Locke disagreed. One of the readings you're going to do for next week is responding, not to stilling fleet, but I just mentioned, is responding to some other critics who think that Locke's views run contrary to um, run contrary to um, Christian views about eternal life. Any questions about what Locke is doing in this section on substance? Yeah. What would uh, be other examples of the immaterial substances? Maybe would be an angel. So, if it, like angels exist, they're not material beings, but they're still, you know, immaterial substances. So if there are other immaterial substances, they're going to be things like angels, God. So divine. Spiritual things. Yeah. Yeah. You know, if you have a soul, soul. Yeah. So, like, I know it's completely not related, but like, what about like Platonic objects? Are they <laughs> immaterial substances? Those generally are not thought to be substances at all. all right. So substances so refer right. to particulars. And in fact, we call, we, it sounds strange to talk about immaterial things this way, but they would be concrete particulars. Whereas a platonic object would be what we call an abstract um, universal. In metaphysics, we talk also about ab the possibility of abstract particulars. Um, and Brianna would be glad to talk to anybody about tropes, I'm sure, if they're interested. She has perfect recall of that. Oh, Any other questions about the notion of substance? So you see, why does Locke believe in substances? How do we get that idea? Um, what And really, what is a substance? How is a substance different from a quality? These are all general things that you should have in your mind. <coughs> so this is what I want us to do in the last parts of class here. Um, why don't we get together in, in groups, and I'll tell you what, just do them with people at your table, at your kind of nearby tables. Get into groups of two or three people, um, and answer these four questions that take us into that, the next part of the reading. So, uh, I believe that this starts us off on page 370, is, um, where you'll see section 9 begin here. And have somebody in your group take down your answers, and as we have time, we'll see if we can start answering them all together. What we're going to be talking about first is where we left off in our last class, which has to do with the nature of personal identity across time. Um, and Locke has a very influential view on what makes the person, the same person over time. And our projector is a little bit off here. Um, actually, just about everything I want is on there, but that obviously looks really weird. Um, is this going to be okay for this, you think? Let's see how this goes. I might try to mess with this over the break as well. Um, so, the first thing to realize when we're getting into this topic is that this is a meaningful question in a lot of, in, in, in more than just a philosophical sense. That it really does make, a, it really does make sense to ask when, what makes someone the same person is a different thing than what, than what makes someone the same human being. So, 
the question of what makes a person versus what makes a human are different questions. So like in the abortion debate, there really aren't any people that are well informed in the debate who are saying that you know, the unborn is not human. Everybody thinks the unborn is a human being, that it's got human DNA, it's a human creature. The question, one of the questions that's brought up in the ethics of abortion is whether or not, though, the unborn is a person. Personhood is a different feature than humanity. Some humans are not persons, and some persons, at least, could be not human. Um, so, for instance, maybe individuals that are in persisting vegetative states. Once again, this would be very contentious, but some people argue are human beings, but they're not persons. Some people, when they get severe mental illnesses or severe dementia, we, we think that they're the same human across time. They don't become different beings. But you might think they're not the same person. That if somebody gets a severe case of dementia or uh, has a severe split personality disorder, that the, the personalities that are d demonstrated or that come out of that one human being are different persons, but not the, they're not the same person. So Locke is approaching this issue, and he's trying to get us to think about what makes for the same human, uh, what makes somebody the same person? And that's kind of an interesting question. And the key to keeping his view straight is recognizing those differences between what makes something the same material body over time? What makes something have the same immaterial soul? And then a third kind of thing that we can track is what makes somebody the same person? So try to keep in your mind these different distinctions. There's the difference between a human being and a person. And that's really the key one to keep separate. So for instance, one other way to get at this, if there are, uh, suppose, something like the Star Trek universe is the same, that our universe happens to be just like that, or very close to it, then there would be Vulcans. Vulcans exist somewhere out there in the, in the, you know, somewhere out there in the universe. Vulcans are not human beings, but they are persons. So a, a person, once again, is different than being a human. Any questions about this initial distinction before I just cruise on, assuming that this makes some sense? Yeah, mm -hmm. Bridget. You said like the dual um, personality thing. Right. It's not considered person, but wouldn't that be like, I mean, like two different persons, but that's still, if you kill that person, it's still killing a, a person, if not multiple. Yeah. You know what I mean? And so in the case of like per multiple personality disorder, the issue would be that there are, it, it maybe you could say not that there, there's one person, but many people. So you could have many persons in one human being. But well, why would that be okay to, I don't know, like not count that as being a, you it would be multiple yeah. persons, but it's still a person. In that case, you're right. I mean, they still have the moral status mm -hmm. of a person. So we couldn't just treat them as if they were non-persons. Like, you couldn't just take somebody with multiple personality disorder and say, well, since you've got many persons in you, let's just, you know, give you a lethal injection. Like, we can't just... That would be unethical. Mm -hmm. Whereas, arguably, in a case of somebody... If it's true, somebody in a persisting vegetative state or an unborn human being is not a person, they don't have the same moral status of persons, and arguably you could treat them in, in a less than, uh, well, this sort of ironic, humane way. But like for someone in like a vegetative state, if they had personality before and they lost kind of the personality through that, does that, so even if you had one before, you, it doesn't count? Right, I mean, if, if you lose it, then you lose it, right? Mm -hmm. So if, let's say whatever makes gives you a certain moral standing, is having a certain feature, like personhood. When you lose personhood, you no longer have that moral standard. Now, you might argue then maybe there's a different criteria for that moral standing. We're not going to get into that in this yeah. class. But that would, that, that's just one way to get motivated into thinking locks on to at least an important distinction here. 
And if you're really interested in this issue, you should take my metaphysics class because we talk a lot about personal identity across time. Don't we? Yes. <laughs> and we talk about some really crazy stuff too. Yeah. Really cool stuff. <laughs> um, if you got your book, um, look at section nine here. Um, so this is going to be <coughs> round three, three sixty, three sixty two. No, wait. After that, sorry. Three seventy. You're right. That's a. Thank you so much. <laughs> um. And for those of y'all that were at the end of last class, we looked at this in groups. Um, what is it that Locke says makes a person the same self over time? What is his word? What's the criteria there? Yeah. Well, it wasn't the, the consciousness of the person. So he talks in terms of consciousness. Now, I think it might even be better, because he doesn't just mean... So consciousness, quite literally, would just be like this present state of mind. Obviously, you don't keep this exact present state of mind over time. It changes. But I think what he means is sort of like maybe what we might call a unified consciousness. The fact that this consciousness that you have right now is connected in the right kind of way to your past consciousness, and hopefully will be connected in the right kind of way to future consciousnesses that you will have. And the way that it's connected to the past, of course, is memory. So memory is going to be really important for Locke. That what makes you what makes you the same person today that you were maybe five years ago is that you have memories that connect this consciousness to that consciousness. So consciousness is the essential feature that makes somebody the same person across time, according to Locke. Um, this gives us a number of implications. That's what a lot of this text is doing in the reading from this point on. Is he's going to go over things that would follow when you accept his view. One is that personal identity is not lost when one's material body is changed. So if you think one view that was out there, and some people hold to a, a more sophisticated version of this today, but is that what makes somebody the same person across time is that they have the same body. But if it doesn't take much to realize that if, your if what makes you you is your body, then when your body changes, you wouldn't be the same person. So if you, you know, cut your hair, you lose some weight, you gain some weight, you um, grow a beard or, you know, shave your legs, all those things would be changes in your body and thereby would make you a different person. So, like, just a question about that, like, Thing is lost in harm. That's a change to your material body that would also impact your personal consciousness, I feel like, in some way. Like, mm -hmm. lost in harm would, would probably have some pretty steep uh, issues. That's right. I mean, think of, I mean, somebody who, like, loses their legs or something real, like that. It technically, a change to a body could also be a change to a personal identity. That that would Not change. Vice versa. I think that, so this would be the thing to ask. Would you think that the change would be so radical that you wouldn't be the same person anymore? Like, it could be. It could be. If you lost the lower half of your body, you definitely would be a very different person. You're going to be very different. The question would be, would, should people no longer like think of you as the same person anymore? So, like, people, like give you a new name. Um, <laughs> like, if you owed debt, would you no longer owe it anymore? If you were married, would you no longer be married? Because that would be a different person. And we think that when we think that personal identity is lost, that would be the kind of thing where you might want to say, then you're no longer, if you had debts, for instance, you'd, be no, you'd no longer owe those debts because you didn't incur them, a different person did. If you were married, maybe you should say, if, when personal identity is lost, you're no longer married because you know, that's a different person altogether. Um, so not just where you would go through a radical change, but such a radical change it would no longer be you, or no longer be that person. So, if you identify what makes you, you, is your body, your material body, when your material body changes, you change. 
Um, I have never looked into the scientific basis for this, but I've heard something like in a period of like 8 to 12 years, every, every single cell in your body is replaced. So, so according to, if that's true, then, pers then you would no longer be the same person once you trade out every single cell in your body. There's a famous uh, philosophical illustration of this with a boat, which suggests, or, or that I just put before you, if you own like a simple little boat that like you go out into the river and fish from, and let's say it's all made of wood, one day you're in the boat and there's like a bad plank in there, so you decide to pull that out and replace it with a new one. Is that boat the same boat? Most of us want to say, yeah, it's the same boat, you just change it out one board. And the next day, another board's squeaky, so you replace it. And the next day, another one. You just do this slowly over time, where you replace every single board in the boat. Is it now the same boat? Some people are hesitant to, to, one, to say it's the same boat anymore. But some, you might think, look, if I granted the first one, I've got to grant everyone after that, so it's the same boat. But now, suppose I saved all the old boards, and I put them in a little shed, and I reassembled the old boat out of those boards. Which one is the boat? <laughs> that, these are puzzles you have to deal with if you identify personal identity with being just the same material stuff. Because could, arguably your bo material body could do the exact same thing that boat does. It'd be, it would take some really good biological engineering, but we, in principle, could do it. Like a clone? Well, imagine we replace one cell with an, another cell, and then we save that cell we just took off, and, and then we replace another cell, and another, and we just do this, like, you know, however many billions of times we need to do it, with what, what is you? Which, is it this body, or the one that we just built out of your old cells? Yeah? What about, like, identical twins? Like, they, like, they look the same, they basically have the same DNA, but so the, all, on this view, if you want to say what makes them the same is the same material stuff, they, they're made out of diff, they're made out of different stuff. They're not made out of the exact same thing, right? That's the same thing. Like we had two water bottles. Like somebody had one of these as well from uh, that had just bought one. I mean, they're identical, but they're not the same thing. Uh, they're made out of different stuff. But what you're suggesting is more what Locke would say. Well, what makes them different isn't the stuff anyway. What makes them different has to do more with their personality, has to do more with their psychology. So how would that be with someone with bipolar mania, where they're basically constantly changing moods? Hold on to that, because that might be a, a, an issue we get to in a moment. Mm -hmm. um, another implication is that, according to Locke, the per personal identity could theoretically be pr preserved across different bodies, meaning you could be the same person in two different bodies if it were possible to transfer consciousness in this way. Now, this is just like a weird science fiction kind of thing, but he's doing this to illustrate a point. Suppose, I think there was a TV show kind of based on this, where when you go to sleep, what if when you go to sleep in this body, you wake up in another one? And you have the exact same memories as you did in, when you're in this body. When you go to sleep in that one, you wake up in this body. Which body is you? Locke would say it doesn't make sense really to talk about which body is you. You're not a body. He would say what makes you you is that stream of consciousness. And that stream of consciousness can be spread across you know, one or two or many bodies. And that's really all that matters. So being the same person for Locke has nothing to do with having the same body or not. It has everything to do with having the same stream of consciousness. Yeah. So, say you were you were in an accident and you had like a head injury and you have amnesia, and for say like so many months you, you lose your personality and then it does come back to you. In that time period, would you, would you consider that to be like a different person altogether? According to Locke, yes. And especially, it gets a lot easier if you say you just never recall them. If you never re learn your old memories again, if there's just a clean break, then it's a separate person. Another implication he considers is that it's possible for one soul, or one spirit, one immaterial substance, to host several different persons. 
this is where he brings up the issue of Castor and Pollux, and um, he talks about a guy that he knew who claimed to have the soul of Socrates, to like you know like reincarnation. Um, on this view, Locke would not say, suppose reincarnation is true. He doesn't believe in reincarnation, but suppose it were correct. He thinks that that, just like if your soul was reincarnated in someone else, that doesn't make that person you. Or if you, brought, if you inherited um, the soul of Napoleon, you would not be Napoleon. Why? Because all that would show is you shared the same soul, the same immaterial substance. But what makes you, you, has to do with your state of mind, that stream of consciousness. And you and Napoleon don't share the same stream of consciousness, even though you share the same soul. Um, so when you think about a soul, all that he's thinking of is like some immaterial you know, spiritual vehicle or holding space that sort of runs your consciousness. But he's not thinking that a soul by its nature must have consciousness, like the same consciousness. Um, and being the same person, therefore, is not the same as being this, uh, uh, is not a matter of being the same substance, whether that's an immaterial substance like a soul or a material substance like a body. So, the whole point behind Locke's view of personal identity is not to make personal identity ident be a matter of being made out of the same stuff, whether it's soulish or spiritual stuff or material stuff. The stuff doesn't matter at all for Locke. What matters is whether or not it's the same stream of consciousness. Um... So one of the questions to think about is why can't the same immaterial soul underwrite uh, personal identity over time? Locke points out a few things with this. One is that it would imply that the same soul that hosted two distinct consciousnesses that have no awareness of one another are the same person, which he thinks is crazy. So just because it's the same soul, it wouldn't mean that, that there would be awareness of the same of those two different consciousnesses. So once again, if reincarnation, for instance, were true, um, suppose you happen to have inherited Napoleon's soul, that wouldn't, if you're completely unaware of the consciousness that Napoleon had, then there's no, then Locke would say it'd be crazy to say you're the same person as Napoleon. How can you be identical with some person of whom you have no awareness of, you know, their stream of consciousness? Um, he considers why can't it be the same material body, the same material body to underwrite personal identity? Um, he says a few things here. One is that it, it makes an afterlife impossible. Um, it seems one thing to worry about, and in the background here is his, he is a Christian, so he's thinking about resurrection and the afterlife. If what makes you the same person over time is having the exact same body, um, one concern is about cannibals. When a cannibal eat, you know, eats another human being, then part of the body of one person becomes the body of the other. If God resurrects everybody, and in order for them to be the same person, they have to have the same body, who gets those material parts? The, the cannibal or the, you know, the guy who was lunch? Um, so, it would be impossible to make an app for an afterlife to work on this kind of model. Um, secondly, without consciousness, all you have is a carcass, that's his phrase. So that if you take consciousness from your body, is that really you? I mean, if your body continued to, to be alive, biologically speaking, would that still would you still say that that is what you are? He would want to say, no, all that is is just, you know, a body. It's just a carcass. And then my way of talking about this is that, obviously he doesn't refer to this, but it gives the wrong result in Freaky Friday scenarios, you know, where you trade bodies uh, you're, you're with somebody, according to this really bad movie. 
So, um, it seems, when we think about cases like these Freaky Friday scenarios, and he has his own version of this with the prince and the cobbler, it seems like the way that, that to identify who is the same person is not through their body, it has to do with their consciousness. So that if, in the Freaky Friday stories, it's a mom and a daughter who switch uh, bodies, we, nobody's inclined to think that that daughter is the same person after they switch consciousnesses. Why? Even though she has the exact same body, we think that doesn't make her who she is. What makes her her is her personality, her stream of consciousness, her memories. So, um, for that reason, being the same material body can't make you the same person across time. Now, if Locke is right, you might wonder, he considers this, why do we hold people legally accountable for what they've done when they have completely blacked out, like when they're drunk? Shouldn't we say that those are two separate persons? So he takes this up in section 22. What he says is, yes, on his view, we would get two different persons. But, um, so if there really was a blackout there, However, proving that you have absolutely no recollection of, of your consciousness in that case is hard, maybe impossible to prove. So, for the purposes of practicality, the law makes no distinction, although actually there is a, di a difference there. Yeah? <coughs> I just want to know how, that, how there would be a difference, because it's still the same consciousness doing it, it's just doing it in a different way than it would normally do it. Like, it's still the same consciousness, just kind of like taking a different path for a certain amount of time. There is a, this is what Locke would say, there is a consciousness there, but it's not the same consciousness that you have now. So if it's completely disconnected by memory from one another, then it's a different person altogether. So he would believe that, like, if somebody were drunk and they acted on their current consciousness then couldn't re recollect what had happened. It was a different, completely different person that had acted on the... Yes. Okay. okay. So, here's a kind of case to think about. Um, one thing you can get when you go to have major surgery, they give you, um, they give you anesthetics that numb you and that numb the pain. But let's say you can't afford that. They have something else that are called amnesia. Amnesiacs are things that they can give you that will cause you to forget the experiences you've had. Suppose you have to get some really painful surgery done, and you can't afford the um, anesthesia, you know, thanks Obama, then <laughs> what you do instead is you can afford the amnesiac, though. So what they're going to do is they're going to put whoever is going into surgery under intensive pain <coughs> but they're going to give you this really powerful drug that causes you to have no memory of it. Locke would say that person who goes into surgery and goes through excruciating pain wasn't you. It was someone else, some other poor individual that you tortured. Um, why? Because that person, that you have no connection with memory to that person. If you have no connection of memory with that consciousness, <coughs> It's a completely separate consciousness. That would be very unethical to do, even on Locke's view, but um, that's another way to see that he's talking about, um, another way to see why consciousness on his view, or some of the implications of consciousness being the mark of an individual across time. Yeah. I read something once where, like, um, if you, like, remembered when you were a baby being born, you'd, like, it would just be like, it would be a miserable person, like you yeah. wouldn't be able to function. I believe it. So, well, <laughs> so does that mean that you're like a different personality when you're, because you don't remember that? This is an objection, you're anticipating the end of all this, but this is one major objection that's brought up by a philosopher named Thomas Reed. We'll get to that. Okay. Um, if you, once again, and this is kind of in line with uh, with also with, with what Kelly brought up, which has to do with mental illnesses. Um, if mental illnesses are so severe that you have 
completely different like streams of consciousness that are unconnected to one another, where one doesn't remember the other. Then, by Locke's account, you'd have to say these are different persons. Like this would be like Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde almost, where you know I don't know if we should say Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde is like bipolar disorder, but if it was severe enough like that, then yeah, the two ends of the spectrum would be two completely different persons. Yeah. What if someone was like like uh, like hypothetically you, you brainwash someone and had made them like have like a different thought process, but they have the same memories of that person. So a little bit like Clockwork Orange, kind of, yeah. which um, I've never seen the movie, so I'd be, uh, based on the book, I would be afraid to watch the movie. But it is kind of a case of like brainwashing somebody to, to change their behavior, change their, their attitudes about certain things. If the memories are still there, even if there's a shift in personality in certain ways, I think Locke would still say it's the same person, because there's continuity of memory. Um, what would he... What would he view like a substance like alcohol or, or um, like a drug? Like, this is gonna sound stupid, but like, would he view them as like a person changer? Like, like I like that doesn't seem only, like almost. Good. Only if it had the power to completely disconnect those consciousnesses. So I mean, of course, a little bit of alcohol doesn't. Right. And even I mean, a good amount of alcohol doesn't. I mean, you have to drink a lot of alcohol to the point where there's like that blackout. Right. Um, so only in those extremes would he say that there is that like sort of person changing going on. Yeah. But even in like a blackout drunk and you still can, uh, through the uh, conversation of I guess other people, have like the memories that make up your consciousness. So doesn't that still make you the same person because you still have your past memories? I think this is kind of an interesting case because while you're drunk, you if you have the ability to remember the past, you're still the same person. So there'd be kind of like a forking here. Um, so if you come here, when you get drunk, let's say this is who you are up here, and you can still remember all your past. But when you wake up, you have no recollection of this little thing. Then up here, you're the same person as, as all of this, but when you're here, you're not the same person as the blackout. There might be an interesting puzzle here about how this all really plays out, because you might be wondering who are the distinct persons, but Locke would want to say something like that. Okay. I like to think about this in terms of the Star Trek transporter. Um, I know not everybody in the room will be a fan, but if I were in the world of Star Trek, as I often like to wonder, I would never get in that transport. I would be like Dr. McCoy from the original series who always uses the, the, the shuttle. Why? Because I don't have Locke's view of personal identity. On Locke's view, you could survive the Star Trek transporter. And the Star Trek transporter, what they essentially do is use a high-energy beam to annihilate your body. Like, your atoms get completely destroyed, like, spread out across the universe. But what they do is they take a perfect, if you will, scan of your body, and then reconstitute your body in another location with that exact same configuration. Now, on Locke's view, you do survive the transporter if, when the new body is constituted, as they do it on the show, you have the same stream of consciousness, the same thoughts, beliefs, intentions, and memories, and so on. All that matters to be the same person isn't being the same stuff. It just matters that you continue to have that stream of thought. And the transporter, in principle, could do that. I've always wondered, because that's all the transporter does, it takes like a scan of like your body and then reconstitute new material to, to create another body just in that state. What would happen if the transporter accidentally, instead of making one thing, created two? That was an episode. They did that on an episode. So who would be the original person? Presumably both people can't be the original. Um, I think they've done. Is this where we get good and bad Spock? And I yeah, but I, I was thinking yeah. of Riker when they they made a, a copy of Riker and left him at the base for like seven years. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't got. I haven't. I don't recall that. 
Um, I'll get to that soon. I'm rewatching The Next Generation right now. Bonus points for that. Um, <laughs> so if you cr actually create two copies of the original, by Locke's definition, they would both be the original. That presumably, they both can't be. Somebody's got, you know, because once again, if, if you were married and then you went through the transporter, the original you is annihilated and two copies of you are made, and both of them have the exact same sort of state of mind, the same memories and personality and so on, which one of them is married to your wife or your husband? You know, if you owe money, which one of those people owes the debt? If you were wanted for a crime, which one of them should be thrown in jail? Um, so, I think this is one kind of problem people raise, is that instantiating that exact same consciousness is in principle possible. Um, another problem to bring up is that, what about young infants who have no memory? So this is related to what you're saying, which is that we don't remember what it was like to be six months old, and thank goodness, having had kids, for one, we do some awful things to them. Um, and that, it's really hard, like teething is incredibly painful. I mean, you just have bone driving through your skin, you know, to cut through it. I mean, ouch. Um, so yeah, we don't remember, uh, we don't have continuity of memory that goes back to being an infant, but it also has the issue of our infant's persons. Um, I think everybody, I hope in this room, would think that taking a young child and ending its life would be immoral. There's a case in the news, it just breaks my heart every time I, I see it, where, um, this guy he recently in this county killed a, a ten-month-old child, I think. Mm -hmm. He was so cute. And, and, be, and apparently he was angry and dealing with lots of kids and slammed the ten-month-old down in his bed and did it too hard and killed him. We think he's done something immoral because he's ended a person's life. On Locke's view, though, how can that be a person if they have no continuity of memory? Um, in a similar kind of vein, one of Locke's contemporaries, Joseph Butler, he wanted to wonder, how do we discern true memories from false ones? And how do false memories impact somebody's own personal identity? Um, these sorts of things come up. I mean, there are famous cases of people who claim to have been molested as children, based on memories they recovered in a therapy session or in a, a counseling session. But then later, even, they come back and say, well, maybe that, those, those memories aren't real. How do you discern real memories from false ones? The past is one of those things we have no way of going back and checking. Um, we can't go back to the past and find out if it's true or not. Um, so how do you know that your, your memories that make you the same person across time are correct? Here's a bigger problem. This is the one raised by Thomas Reed. Um, Reed is trying to make sense of Locke's view. So according to Locke's view, yourself at age 30, let's say, is the same person as yourself at age 15, because at age 30 you have that continuity of memory to your life when you're 15 years old. You can still have a, that stream of consciousness is connected by memory. And at age 15, you're the same self as you are at age 5, let's say, because at age 15, you have that continuity of memory that goes from uh, 15 to 5. But, Locke would say, at age 30, you're probably not the same person as you are at age 5, because at age 30, you don't have the continuity of memory to at age 5. But once you grant those three claims, and if, and if we need to change these ages to make it work for you, we can just change it ever so slightly to get that result. But if you grant 1, 2, and 3, you get a contradiction, because according to 1 and 2, age 30 is identical to age 5. Why? Because if age 30 is identical to age 15, and age 15 is identical to age 5, then by the law of identity, the person at age 30 is identical to the person at age 5. But, according to number three, that's not so. 
the person at age 30 is not the same person as they are at age 5. Once again, creating kind of a problem here for Locke's view. But Locke's view, as much as there are these weird problems with it, it, most philosophers think this is the best thing we've got going. What else makes you the same person across time if not? Something like your consciousness, and maybe by this, this idea of your personality, your memories, your beliefs, um, all of those kinds of things bundled up together. Um, Any questions about Locke's account of personal identity, or really any general issues or, or puzzles about the nature of personal identity? Anybody have any weird what-if cases to deal to think to help us think about to help you understand or challenge Locke's views here? Yeah. So he's saying that your personal identity only is based off like your memories if you can remember the past. The memory is the most important one to connect you to the past. So, I mean, think about this, like in reincarnation cases, th and maybe this is where you, people might have different intuitions, but if, let's say, I exhibited all the personality traits of Napoleon Dynamite because I got his soul, but I don't remember anything having to do with Napoleon. Or did I say Napoleon Dynamite? <laughs> <laughs> Napoleon Bonaparte. <laughs> Yeah. So, <laughs> it's better than mistakes I've made in some of my other classes. So, if I, if I get Napoleon Bonaparte's soul, but I, and I inherit his personality traits, but none of his mem I have no memories of that, there, some people would say that I'm not the same person as him. I would need to remember, you know, his thoughts and his consciousness from back when he existed to be the same person. Other people might say, well, if you really had enough of those personality traits, even if you don't remember, maybe that would be a good case to say it's the same person. I think Locke just has the view that if you're the same person, you've got to remember. It's kind of like the stuff on innate ideas, where he's going to say, if you've got the ideas, then you've got to know them. If you're the same person, you've got access to the, the, that person's consciousness. Yeah? Um, could you go over the objection brought up by... Butler again? I, I was kind of confused on like what he, what was said in that. The main thing with it is just there are if the main criteria is memory, then trying to figure out the nature of memory itself is tied up with personal identity. So if I rem so in the case of like false memories, if you and probably all of us have some false memories, things like you remember. I was the best person on my soccer team, <laughs> or um, you know something like that. Where you, and if it come, turns out that's part of like how you think of yourself and who you are as a person. But if in fact you were not, things didn't turn out the way that you remember them now. Then maybe you're not actually connected to your past self in the right way. Um, and then there's just the other issue of then how do you even get down to figuring out when do you have the true memories and the false ones. Because for most things we have, we don't have access to the past. Like, we don't have a videotape or anything like that to go confirm or deny our memories. We just go off our memories. So if, that's, if we have a ton of false memories, how would we ever know that we're that far off? So is he disputing the fact that <coughs> um, the self is not based on consciousness for, and memories, like for the sake of memory? Or was he just questioning how do we get to these true or false memories? In Butler's case, he's trying to poke holes in Locke's theory because Butler thinks what makes you the same person across time is not memory. Okay, all right. So would that go into someone's perceptions? Say if you think of the past as you're the star of the soccer team, mm -hmm. really you weren't, but you grow up and you live the rest of your life believing that, but in reality you weren't, you know, where does that really come into, like, what is the... Yeah. Like the nurse or the I think it's even things a little bit even crazier, but, but still believable, which are things like, even at the time, let's say we're thinking about, like, life in middle school, which for me seems like forever ago, not for many of you maybe, but I might think, 
I might now think, you know, when I was in middle school, I was kind of shy, but the girls really did like me. <laughs> but when I was in middle school, let's say my consciousness then did not think that. I didn't think, oh, I'm kind of shy, they all like me. At that time, my thoughts are, nobody likes me, you know, I smell weird. <laughs> if my mem memory of that time doesn't match up with my consciousness at that time, then how can I be the same person on long speed? So it's not just, it'd be different. One way to take what you said would be, I had the false beliefs at the time, and I still have the false beliefs today. Mm -hmm. That would actually still make you the same person on long speed. The issue would be, what if you had true beliefs of yourself then, and you had false beliefs of the way it was back then? Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. What about personality? So usually, as long as it's connected in the right way to where you don't, to where it's all the same. Like, because you can go from having like a shy personality to having a more outspoken one. But as long as it's not like such a shift or a break that you no longer remember, like the one life or the other, Locke is fine with that. And we tend to think that at least gradual changes in personality don't create new persons altogether. Like we do think people can change. Um, and so Locke would want to accommodate the possibility of change for sure. The thing that scares, m well, not scare us, the thing that we get more concerned about are radical changes. Um, and sometimes in marriages and, and in, o in other committed relationships, we say things like when we're breaking up about, you know, you're not the same person that you were when I married you. And there's some one sense in which that's just kind of not literal, we don't literally mean you're a different person, but sometimes we can mean it in a literal way, that you are not the same person. And I married one kind of person, you turn into another one, and I don't want to be married to the new one anymore. If you make the... So if you make the criteria more about personality, there's actually a sense in which that would be true. If you make the criteria just about memory, uh, Locke probably wouldn't let you get away with saying you're a different person in that case. But these are all really hard issues to, to think about. I mean, one of the things we're going to be looking at the last reading for today is concerns about resurrection and the afterlife. Um, Locke was attacked because they thought his view implied atheism, that it implied uh, no immortal soul. So um, a lot of people had to step up and defend him on, on this. Any other thoughts? After this, we're, we're done with personal identity. So her. how does, like, maturity, like, fall into this? What do you mean? Like, the more, like, you grow up, you change. Like, So as long as that the, the changes are connected by continuity of memory, he's going to be cool with that. So as you grow older, you might do new things, you might have new per you might take on new personality traits, He's cool with that as long as there's, a sim there's that same stream of consciousness connected through memory. So going back to like a, yeah, like that split fork right there on Blackboard, when you're in that, that fork, you're still a person. Yeah. So effectively when that ends, that, that person dies, right? That's, that's right. That person ceases <laughs> to exist. That should have more problems, then, especially with the uh, amnesia you had, yeah. Because that's like killing the person. In, indeed. <laughs> so you may have, I mean, for Locke, if each person is just a connected set of memories, then anytime you, you, through your own actions and your own sort of self, create sort of this bubble of memories that are disconnected, you're essentially creating and ending a person's life. Maybe that's a strange result for his view. That was the basis of the argument for the woman, right, that we were reading about in the last section, that Locke believes that when you're, because he believed right. that your consciousness would stop when you, like, went to sleep or something That's like that. That's right. She says that you're waking up each day as a completely new person with a new consciousness. Exactly. And then, and then that goes to, like, if that were the case, like, how does that work? And then Locke would respond by saying, the, s the soul already has these ideas ingrained into it, and we just react based on, like, objects. And, and we'll, then, we'll yeah. say more about all that tonight. Yeah, that's right. I'm, that's seeing, it, I'm seeing it connect now. <laughs> Good. So part of the reason I'm taking the time to go over this, if we don't get this, then what we're doing in the last hour of class will not be as exciting.
I know, it's hard to imagine because this class is always so exciting. <laughs> Any final thoughts? This is... We'll pick up personal identity again in our last hour tonight. Um, let's go ahead and take a break and let's come back in about, let's give it a 11 minutes. So when this clock says 6.31, we shall pick right back up. So we're going to move to the last part of the reading that was assigned for Locke, and this is that section on knowledge. So after going through all the different things that we've gone through on Locke, this is going to tie in actually most closely with where we started with Locke, which is empiricism. Um, and we look at section one under book four, chapter nine. Um, it, this is exactly where it picks up, is that knowledge only comes through sensation. Now, there are a couple of exceptions. He thinks that we have some kind of immediate and a direct awareness of our own self that is not through experience. And he also has this interesting kind of proof for the existence of God that he thinks doesn't depend on experience. We're not going to worry about those two things. If you want to read about his argument for the existence of God, you can just go back and read pages... Uh, Uh, yeah, 405 to 410. 405 to 411, right before all this, if you want. Um, for those of you that have studied some of this before, it's essentially another version of a cosmological argument for the existence of God. But let's focus on the other stuff. Everything else besides knowledge of oneself and, one, and knowledge of God. So, he thinks that all knowledge, anything that we can say you know has to be associated with or originate from experience. And the way that he, I think the intuitive idea behind this is that if one acquired ideas apart from sensation, it would not count as knowledge because there's no causal link between the ideas and the real object that's out there in the world. So why is it that you can say that you know, according to Locke, you can know that this is a water bottle? because you're having certain sensations right now, and those sensations are produced by the water bottle. But here's kind of a weird case. Suppose right now, um, the president, let's say, is in New York City. And you just happen to form the belief the president is in New York City. And let's say you're not following the news, you don't keep up with these things, it just sort of strikes you as you're like, you know, eating a sandwich or something. You're like, you know what? I believe the president's in New York City. And if the president is, in fact, in New York City, most people aren't going to say that you know that the president is in New York City. You got lucky. Why? Because we think there's no causal link between your belief and what makes that belief true, what the belief is about. Sensation gives us that connection, according to law. It's the fact that you're having those sensations about the water bottle or about the person sitting next to you or whatever it is that connects your ideas, your beliefs, with reality. The other really cool thing about Locke's view is that knowledge, unlike maybe Descartes, knowledge does not require absolute certainty. I do want to read section two here. So open up to page 411. Um, let's take a look on the right column. I'm going to read all of section two because it's kind of short. Um, he says, It is therefore the actual receiving of ideas from without that gives us notice of the existence of other things and makes us know that something does exist at the time without us, which causes that idea in us though perhaps we neither know nor consider how does it. For it does not take away from the certainty of our senses and the ideas we receive by them that we do not know the manner in which they are produced. While I write this, I have by the paper affecting my eyes that idea produced in my mind which whatever object causes I call white. And by this I know that the quality or accident whose appearance before my eye always causes that idea, does really exist and has a being without me. And of this, the greatest assurance I can possibly have, 
and to which my faculties can attain is the testimony of my eyes, which are the proper and sole judges of this thing, whose testimony I have reason to rely on so as so certain that I can no more doubt while I write this that I see white and black and that something really exists and that causes that sensation in me than that I write or move my hand, which is a certainty as great as human nature is capable of. So, knowledge does not require absolute certainty. He thinks that you can know, for instance, that there is this water bottle in front of you, even though it's possible in some far-fetched way that there is no water, water bottle here. Maybe it's a hologram. Maybe you're dreaming. Maybe an evil demon is torturing your mind. All those things are possible, but Locke says you don't need to have that. All that you need to have is this kind of assurance from, and he uses this word testimony from your senses. If you're in a courtroom and you get testimony about some event that took place, you weren't there, somebody else kind of informs you of it. In a way, that's kind of what Locke says about your, your senses. You're, you don't get to have direct access to the way the world is. But you've got these sort of testimonies that you're constantly getting from your five senses that are constantly testifying to how the way the world is. And he thinks that we should have a kind of maybe prima facie trust of those, te of those sensory faculties. Have we used this phrase prima facie in here before? So it's kind, of, it, it's kind of a legal term. It literally in Latin means first face. The idea behind it is that it is innocent until proven guilty. So you should trust your senses until you have good reason not to trust them. Descartes took the other approach. Descartes said, don't trust your senses until they give you a reason to trust them. So if you think that your senses can be trusted without having any other reason to trust them besides you've got them, then you, you can generate knowledge out of them a lot, more, a lot more quickly. Now he's got more to say about why we should trust the senses, but he thinks that we should have this kind of initial trust in what our senses tell us. And that's what we're going to go on to talk about now, is that he gives us four reasons to trust our sensory faculties. And these are given in sections four, five, six, and seven. So in section four, he talks about how our sensory faculties are the only source we have for external things. Um, and in there, he's, he brings up things like the taste of a pineapple. If you had within your mind the, already the sensation of what it was like to taste a pineapple, then you wouldn't need to have to come into contact with an actual pineapple to produce that taste. But nobody thinks that like the idea of what it's like to taste a pineapple is inside like your tongue, and that just contact with the pineapple unlocks that sensation. So the only way that we can learn what it's like for to get the taste of a pineapple is to go out and make contact with that thing. Um, so in other words, our sensory faculties do not produce ideas all by themselves, all alone. Um, otherwise, we could produce any idea apart from a particular object's causes. But we don't think for somebody that's never tasted pineapple, we don't think that if they just use their imagination really well, they could conjure up the idea of what a pineapple tastes like. Or if you've never seen the color red, we don't think that if you just really use your imagination thoroughly, you could come up with what it's like to see the color red. You only get those ideas through sensation. The second reason that he gives is that our sensory faculties produce these ideas in us involuntarily. Now this is an idea that is kind of, t if you can remember way back to Descartes in the Sixth Meditation, this is something Descartes does kind of bring up in a way. So he compares the difference between daydreams and memories with the experiences that you have presently. When you like 
daydream or you remember, you control what you believe. That you choose to recall that past experience. Or you choose to dream about, you know, sitting on a beach in Hawaii. But un unlike those things, right now, the experience that you're getting through your senses occurs against your will. You have no control over this. You might wish that instead of, you know, seeing me up here, that instead it could be, you know, somebody like, you know, Brad Pitt or, um, you know, Angelina Jolie or somebody else cool. But instead you're stuck with me. Um, you might wish that instead of me talking about John Locke right now, instead I was talking about something cool like Star Trek or chess. Um, you might you might wish that instead of seeing you know your book and your paper and your notes in front of you, you know that instead it was you know like strawberry pie or something delicious like that. So. Un instead, the experiences that you have come to you involuntarily. You don't get to control this stuff. That seems to imply that there is some reality independent of me that makes me have these ideas. Any questions about these first two of the four before moving on? So the third one is that um, the ideas that we that we produce presently have a kind of vivid experience of pain and pleasure associated with them that isn't the case with memories. Like if you can remember like a, a really painful experience you had. So like when I was six years old, I was riding my bike down the street and I got hit by a car. And I can still remember that event pretty well. But when I think about that event, I don't feel the pain that I had when I got hit by a car. But right now, if I were hit by a car, I could not stop feeling the pain. So there is something more, the, the reality of our present experience is privileged in a way, he thinks. So the maybe a better example is, can you remember the last time you had a headache? You might say, yeah, I can really remember. I remember the day, I remember what I was doing, and I can kind of remember it's one of those headaches that was like on the front, you know, or whatever, however you describe it. But do you go through the experience of feeling the headache all over again by remembering it? No. There's a different kind of realism or force that comes to ideas of the present compared to ideas of memories or daydreams. And the fourth thing is that each faculty can be used to confirm one another. So that what you, you can see... So if you want to know, is my book really here? According to Locke, if you really get skeptical, you can look at it, you can touch it, you can smell it, get really excited, you can taste it. The, all of your different senses confirm that the book is there. Um, so if you, if you were really concerned about something being a hologram, one way to be, to be to sort of raise your knowledge of that is to make sure you could double check. Don't just look at it, touch it. And so your senses give you several different independent lines of knowledge about what it exists out there. If, so in other words, if there wasn't a real world out there that was causing you to have these ideas, it would almost be like a miracle that you're getting independent confirmation from each one of your senses that reality is this way. If there was no real world and we were just being like tricked or something, you would think actually that your five senses, that, that your senses would give you different reports about the way the world is. But instead, you're getting one sort of harmonious picture from all of your sensory faculties. Any questions about these two? Yeah. What about like a simulated experience? No, we don't have anything like this technical, but the holograms you just said. Um, you could make a hologram in such a way where you would never be able to tell outside the fact that maybe you know it's a hologram that that's one. Are you thinking like, one, could you touch this hologram? Yeah. Could you, if it, we made holographic food, you could eat it yeah. and smell it? At what point would it not be, would you say that it's not real though? I mean, if you can do all those things with it, wouldn't it be real? Okay. <laughs> I mean, the holodeck on Star Trek, if I can go there, um, 
does kind of present these kinds of cases where, in one sense, they want to say it's not real, but it seems to be about as real as anything else. Okay. The only way in which it's not real in those cases, you can't take it off the holodeck. But if we make, if we extend the holodeck further, it seems like it's real to me. Yeah. Sorry. You're, You're fine. I have a, a for number three. Mm-hmm. I'll go with the ideas produced. Um, what if you could like, you think of like an experience, like you said, like a, you were in a car accident or something. What if you think back to that and you get like anxiety from it just by thinking of it? Because that, yeah, w would that be the same as like the full pain perception? Because you are getting anxious. You could like maybe think of the thoughts that you had, like the thoughts of fear. If you think back, if you can maybe recur the same, like the same thoughts occur, would, yeah. would that be plausible or? Locke would want to say you. That's okay. In fact, you you will have to have some recall that's similar and might even involve psychological and, and other responses, but it won't be as vivid as it is when it's present. So, I mean, some of you, if you think about some of these cases, maybe when you start saying, you know, when I do think about it, I do feel a little bit of pain when I recall that headache or that accident or that event. That's okay. That's consistent with what he's saying. He's just saying it's not as vivid as it would be. I mean, sometimes we're going to see this when we talk about David Hume, um, but I'll probably use the same example, but like if you really think about right now biting into like a really, really sour lemon, think about that sour lemon and just imagine taking a big bite out of it, your mouth actually starts to water and pucker even a little bit at the thought of it, but it's still not like it would be if you actually did it. <laughs> Now, this is one of my sort of favorite parts, not necessarily because I agree with it, but the way he kind of throws the smack down here on Descartes. Um, so, one of the things that we should bring about, that according to Locke, I mean, he's not going to rule out the possibility that you're dreaming right now. So, what does he have to say about that? Let's take a look at section 8. I'm going to read a little bit of it. Let's start on the bottom left on 413. And pay attention... And think about what is Locke's concern, response to the concern that his account of knowledge does not meet the standard of absolute certainty, that we couldn't be dreaming. All right, so he says, But yet, if after all this anyone will be so skeptical as to distrust his senses and affirm that all we see and see, hear, feel, and taste, think, and do during our whole being is but the series and deluding appearances of a long dream of which there is no reality, and therefore will question the existence of all things or our knowledge of anything, I must desire him to consider that if all is a dream, then he does but dream that he makes the question. And so it does not matter that a waking man should answer him. But yet if he pleases, he may dream that I make him this answer, that the certainty of things existing in rerum natura, real nature, when we have the testimony of our senses for it, is not only as great as our frame can attain to, but as our condition needs. Let me skip to the bottom of section 8, go up about like seven lines. So he says, now thus, this evidence is as great as we can desire, being as certain to us as our pleasure or pain, happiness or misery, beyond which we have no concern, either of knowing or being. Such an assurance of the existence of things without us is sufficient to direct us in the attaining the good and avoiding the evil, which is caused by them. This is the important concern we have of being made acquainted with them. So what is he saying about this concern you might be dreaming? What's his response to that possibility here? Yeah. Um, it's saying that in your dreams you can control anything that will happen. Like if you like, there's an absolute certain certainty of like, like you have complete control in in the dream state. I don't see him saying that. Although that is something we sometimes think about, like that might tell us that we're dreaming. Think about what I finished, especially read right at the very end here. What is he saying about that? Sort of that what matters most is 
our pleasure and our pain, and that should be enough to have us act in accordance with certain ways and have us follow our senses. That our senses tell us everything we need to know for our purposes. Like, and so he connects us with like our pain, our pleasure, our happy, our misery. I mean, if this is just all one big dream, I mean, your whole life is one big dream, that still doesn't mean that like you're just going to throw it all away. Um, I mean, it still matters to you, you know, if you're going to be happy tomorrow or if you're going to be miserable tomorrow. Um, he doesn't think life is one giant dream, of course, but he wants to say if that's the way you want to go with this, that his response is more to say, we have been given the ability to know what we need to know. That essentially, he's thinking of God here. That God made us in such a way that we can know all the stuff we need to guide our lives. If you want more than that, then you're essentially asking God to have made you so to make you almost omniscient. He says, "Why you don't need to be like that? You just God has made you with everything you need to govern your life." This kind of goes back to the very first part of the reading from last from two weeks ago, that Locke has this view that human beings are limited in what they can know. And he's very aware of that. So he's almost like saying, be aware of your limitations and understand that we can't know everything. And instead of trying to look, know more than we're capable of, be content with what we are capable of knowing. So while it is not absolutely certain, the knowledge is as great as we need it for human affairs. And he drives this home beautifully in section 10. And turn over to page 414. Um, and this is like, once again, his response to somebody like Descartes. Where, and he's going to kind of call him some names here. So he says, by means of which yet we may observe how foolish and vain a thing it is for a man of a narrow knowledge who having reason given him to judge of the different evidence and probability of things and to be swayed accordingly he says how vain I say it is to expect demonstration and certainty in things not capable of it and refuse assent to very rational propositions and act contrary to very plain and clear truths because they cannot be made out so evident as to surmount every the least, I will not say reason, but pretense of doubting. He, who in the ordinary affairs of life would admit of nothing, but direct plain demonstration would be sure of nothing in this world, but of perishing quickly. So in other words, if you had to be absolutely sure of everything to know it, well, then you can't know that the next drink you take is going to be you know, nourishing, or the next bite of food you eat is nourishing. For all you know, it could kill you, or it doesn't exist. It could be a hologram, or you could be in a dream. You needed to know those things with certainty before you acted on them, well, then you'd die before anything would happen. He thinks that it is vain, and it is prideful for people to have Descartes' view, that you have to know it without any room for doubt, because... Locke says, we're not made that way. This kind of knowledge is not capable of that sort of proof. To demand that I know it with certainty, or else I won't know it at all, is to just set the bar way too high. It's to demand too much of something that can't give you that. It's like, if you've got a moped to get around on, and you say, I'm only going to take this thing if it will go 70 miles an hour, well, you're not going to go anywhere on it because the moped can't do that. But that seems like, I mean, that misses the point. The moped wasn't designed to do that. Use it the way it's supposed to be used. Locke is saying use your sensory faculties the way they're supposed to be used. If you're saying your sensory faculties have to give you certainty before you believe them, you're just asking for something that's unreasonable. You're, you're being foolish and prideful. So in section 9, that we, is between the two readings I give, I, I just went over, he says that knowledge is only limited to one's sensations. So he's got this view that you can only know, with like a capital K, know, things that 
are presently before you. So you don't know that anyone else exists right now besides people that are presently before you in sensory experience. So even if you saw somebody earlier today and they're not in this room, Locke would say, Locke says that you have a high probability in, in, knowing, in believing that they exist, but you don't know that they exist. And, and maybe this actually might map on to a lot of our intuitions, that if I were to say, right now, do you, if you drove up here today, do you know where your car is? You might say, I think it's where I left it, but you know, I don't know because maybe somebody stole it, or got towed, or something like that. Um, and that's the kind of thing I think Locke has in mind. You know it when you've got that connection to it with your senses. But the minute that connection is broken off, you don't know it anymore. Now, this kind of raises an interesting question. Um, what would Locke say about watching people on live TV or through video chat? If I'm watching, let's say, the, the president give a speech on live TV, do you think Locke would say that I know it, or do you think he would be hesitant to grant me that? I don't know the, I mean, this is sort of a question for debate, so it's not a right answer to this. Um, what case would you want to make on Locke's behalf here, that you know it or you don't know it? Will? I'd say that you don't know it because you're only using certain senses, and you can't cross-check those senses all of them. Because each sense has what they get. Mm -hmm. Checks and balances, I think, according to Locke. We got two of them, though. I can see yeah. the president, I can yeah. hear him. Reach out, touch it, which I think would be required for me to know that. Because that could just be yeah. a hologram. Probably. Although I don't reach out and I don't think and touch any of y'all to confirm right. y'all here. I could, but I don't. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I would agree with, uh, with Will because I think about like a green screen and how like a person can appear to be in Hawaii on the beach when they're really mm -hmm. next door to you, just in front of a screen that creates the optical illusion that they're far away or in a different place than they actually are. There's technological trickery that we could always be concerned. It might say live in the corner, but how do I know it's really live? It might be pre-taped or something like that. Mm -hmm. If you're on FaceTime with somebody, do you know that they exist according to log, or is it the same thing, that there could be technological trickery so that doesn't put you in touch with them. Yeah. Well, I think that intersect is a little bit different because you're actually talking to them back and forth, whereas if you're watching on the person on TV, you're not conversing with them. He's not responding to you. So maybe there's a little bit more of that feedback, that kind of like what Will said. It's a little different, but a little more confidence in it. What about this? Go ahead. Go ahead. Well, I would say like if it was like a live link type of thing, and you had like a stream of conversation, then. It's kind of like them being there presently. Yeah, they're understanding. Yeah. What about if I looked at? Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, what, uh, what if you had a game? This is a, this is a game like this where you can input stuff, and it, it does that. I mean, as soon as you do it. So I'm uh, going to that argument that you have a, a direct input that that game exists. Then. <laughs> well, I was thinking. I don't know if this is what you had in mind. I was thinking about uh, you know these. Uh, games that you can play where you have groups of people are yeah. like playing them and you can chat to one another while you're in the game. In other words, kind of like Call of Duty sort of like. Yeah, so in games like Call of Duty, World of Warcraft, many of these things, like do you know those other people exist because of the chatting messages? Now, that fits more like what you're saying with like, hey, there's interaction, but it's a lot less sensory, right? You don't see them, you don't hear them. I mean, it's like through like an avatar on the screen. I think Locke would say to that, no, you don't know they exist. But that's, so what's the difference in these cases? Here's another one. Suppose there's somebody out in the hall right now. We can't see them directly, but I get a big mirror and I put it there. Do you see them, in, do you know they exist on Locke's view if you see them in the mirror? They probably wouldn't know because it's just an optical illusion. You might be concerned that, once again, there's some kind of trickery, so maybe it's an optical illusion. 
What if, uh, you know, if you're cool with one mirror, what if I did it through two mirrors, right? So through two mirrors, we're able to see somebody around the corner. And then if you like that, three, four, how many mirrors could I put up till you'd say, okay, we're no longer able to know they exist? Or would you be fine as long as there, I mean, take as many mirrors as you like, it would work. I mean, you're still observing the light that is reflected off the person. It's the same light. That's what we're going to so you might f be more comfortable with the mirrors than you are with the technology for that reason, yeah. that there's literally the same light molecules of the photons of light that connect you to them. Once, so this is one thing I'm trying to bring out through this, is that as much as we kind of like putting down certainty, like, you know, yeah, Descartes really was overreaching what he was capable of doing, here's the other problem, though. Once you dial it down, how do you draw those lines where you need to draw them? Um, I'm not saying you can't do it, but it's going to be really hard to be principled about it and say, okay, it's good in this case and it's bad in that one. With Descartes, at least he's got a line in the, in, that you know if you've crossed it or not. just gives you the unhappy result that you don't know a lot of things that you like to know. Um... Any questions about what I'm doing with, with this or what Locke's view is? I think in a lot of ways Locke's view is very, in this respect, is very commonsensical, but it doesn't mean it doesn't have some difficulties or some interesting things to think about. So, if knowledge only pertains to present experiences, how do we know things about the past? Because we do want to say that we know, um, you know, that George Washington was the first president of the United States. Or that we know that, you know, it's when I was six years old, I lived in Houston, Texas. How do I know those things? Well, Locke does want to say that you can know things through memory. And once again, you might think this betrays the spirit of what we just did. But he thinks maybe memory is like a kind of sensory experience, very similar to you know, your immediate sensory experience. So he says in section 11, we have knowledge of the past existence of several things of which our senses having informed us, our memories still retain the ideas. And of this we are past all doubt so long as we remember well. But this knowledge also reaches no further than our senses have former, formerly assured us. So he wants to say, because your senses once gave you knowledge of these things, as long as you can remember them well, then you can still, you can still claim to have knowledge of that through memory. Now, the key thing that I worry about with this is, what does he mean by remember well? That seems to hide a lot in it. How do you remember well? When do you, can you tell the difference between when you remember well and remember poorly? If I'm thinking about my childhood friend, and I rem and I really feel confident his dog's name was Sparky, and then the next day I'm like, wait, wait, it wasn't Sparky, it was it was Parker, and then I worry about maybe it was just Park. You know, at first I thought I remembered well, but after I start thinking about it more, I become more and more doubtful about the whole thing. Is remembering well something we can ever be sure that we do? What does it mean? Under, can you tell when you actually do correctly remember anything? So the, I worry that he's trying to paint this picture of your memories. If you've got if you've got vivid memories of cases of knowledge that were informed by your senses, then as long as you remember those experiences well, you can still know it. But I'm not sure how we can really tell the difference between remembering well and remembering poorly. Wouldn't you, I guess, remember well if you are taking a test and if, let's say you put all the correct answers, you remember all the answers, and you're right, like, isn't that in the form And have you ever taken a test that you thought you remembered well and that you didn't, and the teacher said you didn't? So you might say, in fact, you remember well when it's correct, but the issue is, well, how do you know when you remember well when you don't? What would you say, like, they're the 
people that can like actually recount exact dates and like what they were wearing, like yeah. right oh, down to mm-hmm. everything. And like they said, it's like these people are so rare, it's unbelievable. What would he say about that? Yeah, that's would a really. Do that you remember well? I think he would say, <laughs> if it's connected to your your senses in the right way, I think he would say yes. There's a really cool one I've shown in some of my classes that you can find. Um, BBC did it. There were clips of it on YouTube. I don't know if it's still. It's called The Boy with the Amazing Brain. And it talks about this guy. He, like, memorized pi out to, like, the... I forget how many decimal. Like, it took him all day to say it. So it was, like, something like... It was out to, like, a 100,000 digits or something. Um, and, and, and with pi, as you might know, is a non-repeating number. So it's not even, like, it, there's, like, a pattern or something to it. Um... And there's in this video they talk about another guy who can remember the the weather every day of his life, <laughs> yeah. and since he was like six years old. Both of these guys had like you know head injuries, which is interesting <laughs> too, that may have given them this ability. Would well, maybe maybe lots of find that everyone has a different standard of remembering the weather. It's all different people and their standard of different time. Each experience is different. Possibly. I think one of the concerns I have about going that route, though, is that then, just depending on your own standard, you might be easier, you could get knowledge easier than me. That doesn't seem right to me. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) If you've got low enough standards, uh, you can get to the, you can have it remember well easier. What I'm even worried about, though, It seems like remembering well is not something you can just tell from self-reflection. So whether you remember well or not isn't just something you're able to just tell by thinking about, how did I do that time? Um, Whether you remembered well or poorly is something you have no perspective on. just got a couple more things and then we're done with Locke. So one of the other things that he talks about near the end here is that by his standards, we cannot say that we know anything about spirits besides God and for reasons that have nothing that have to do with, with some other things. So sort of forget God for the moment. But like, so Locke is a Christian. He believes in angels and demons. But he doesn't say that he knows that angels and demons exist. Why is that? Because he's never experienced one. Since you can't have a, an experience of, at least most of us don't have experiences of angels or demons, we can't, in his view, know that they exist. We can't. Um, and what he would also say is, is that we have evidence from Revelation, from the Bible, that these things exist. But he wouldn't call that knowledge. He would say that that just makes it very probable that they exist. For him to know it would once again require the ability to have that experiential contact with it, which he says he doesn't have. Why is God an exception to this? Because he thinks he's got a proof, like a demonstration of like absolute certainty that God exists. Um, if you've got something like that, then you can know it. But for an- angelic beings, we don't have anything like yeah. So, using the same thing, what about like something like radiation? Like, most of us have never probably experienced radiation, but we have like evidence of it through other people. So we don't know any. Like I don't. So under his definition, I don't know anything about radiation. So uh, about like high doses. Of course, we're like radiated every day. Yeah. Like our computer screens, the sun. And, uh, but you mean like high doses of like gamma rays or something? Um. He might be inclined to say if you have not had the direct experience of it, then you don't know it. Um, that you just have a very high probability of it. Um, so a lot of things you learn in science and history books and things, I guess, you don't, on his view, you don't know. Um, but once again, he'd, he'd be comfortable saying, but you know it with a high degree of probability. Mm-hmm. What about like I've never like met like Barack Obama personally, so I don't. Does that mean I don't? But then, what if I like know someone who has? Yeah. Or I know them and they <laughs> know he exists. So can I like? 
I don't think that he's going to let you piggyback off other people's knowledge. But if we can get the TV screen to work, then you can know it. Okay. Or, yeah. Um, two last things in this part. One of them, so he's going to talk about our knowledge of two different kinds of propositions. So the first kind are affirming the existence of an idea, and what he means by this is our knowledge of particular things. Our knowledge that, you know, this book exists, or that, um, I am wearing this shirt or whatever. It's a knowledge of something in particular, not of anything general or universal. So he says, all of our knowledge of the existence of particular things comes through experience. Big surprise. Um, the bigger thing for us to think about has to do with our knowledge of universal or general things. Our agreement or disagreement of our abstract ideas and their dependence with one another. That's what he says. A nice way to put that is just the way that our general concepts, our universal ideas, truths that have to do with them. Like we say, all bachelors are unmarried. You know, all instances of, of red are instances of color. Um, all squirrels are mammals. Those are all universal ideas. So. If you're locked, when you make any of those kinds of universal claims, here's one thing you need to be worried about. First of all is you don't experience all of them. If I say all squirrels are mammals, do you know that? Well, you don't experience every single squirrel. Uh, if I say all bachelors are unmarried, you haven't experienced every single bachelor. So how do we have knowledge about those things? Because he thinks we do know them. And it has to do by reflecting on those ideas, and through that process of reflection, we can sort of abstract the essential components and then see certain general truths that will hold for all of them. So the example that he gives is maybe a difficult one, but this is what he says. The example that he thinks is a universal truth is that God is to be feared and obeyed by humans. So, Locke thinks that just by reflecting on the nature of human beings, reflecting on the nature of God, and reflecting on the nature of what it means to be feared and obeyed, that it would follow just by understanding those concepts from, that we derive from particulars, that we can see that it's universally true that God is to be feared and obeyed by humans, generally speaking. Maybe a better example would be one thing to think about our squirrels. Um, squirrel, all squirrels are mammals. That is something that is a universal truth we can know because just based off of our particular experience of squirrels and our particular knowledge of each individual mammal, we can extrapolate that all squirrels are like this and all mammals are like that, therefore all squirrels are mammals. Um, he talks about stuff, this <coughs> idea of what he calls eternal truths, and this is because this is what they were called in his time. Things like, all, for all triangles, the interior angles add up to two right angles. He, he, want, he says we can call these, these eternal truths if you like, but uh, because whenever they are formed, they must be true. But he doesn't think that these ideas exist in someone's mind eternally. Uh, after all, that's the, just the sort of thing that those rationalists who believe in innate ideas would say. So he doesn't want to give aid and comfort to them. And that's essentially it for this reading on 411 to 415. Are there questions about anything else in this part? So in summary, this is the big stuff with law. He is an empiricist. You go all the way back, he rejects the existence of innate ideas. He doesn't think that reason is an original source for the ideas that we possess. Um, he thinks all of our ideas come through experience, and that experience furnishes us with all of our ideas through sensation and reflection. 
Substances, if you remember that little bit we did on substances, are unclear ideas. We don't know what substances are, but we have to believe they exist. The problem of free will can be resolved by clarifying our terms and reframing the issues through those terms. Personal identity is a matter of having the same consciousness. And then knowledge does not require absolute certainty and extends only to the present testimony of the sense. Any questions about any of this lock stuff before we lock it up? We've got more puns. Um, then let's take another break here and let's come back when the clock says 735.